Okay, um, so um, I guess let's get started. Um, can everyone hear me? I mean, at least the moderators um, and speakers. Um, so um, thank you very much uh, for joining um, our HUPO um, Aging and Disease webinar um, uh, organized by myself and Dr. Uh, Alexandra Nidan Nazar. On, on behalf of the HUPO Biology and Disease Human Protein Project. Um, so our program is going to run from now until um, about um, two and a half hours later. And um, after each talk, um, we are going to have um, five to 10 minutes for questions. Um, and so um, please, um, Includes your question in, in the chat, and we are going to read them out for you. And feel free to include um, your name with the questions as well. Um, so, um, with so um, our first speaker um, is Dr. Uh, Roger Riddell, and um, Dr. Roger Riddell is um, professor and director at um, Children's Medical Research Institute, University of Sydney. And his lab um, focus is on understanding how cancer cells continue to proliferate using um, the alternative lengthening of telomeres mechanisms, um, which are important for senescence, aging, and all cancers. Um, and his talk title is Progress Towards Utilization of Tissue Proteomics in the Cancer Clinic. So without further ado, um, um, I'm going to pass the mic to Dr. Radell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie. I'll share my screen. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Oh, great. Yes. Okay, and it's the right view. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, thank you very much for the invitation to to speak. Um, what I'd like to um, uh, take you through today is the progress that we are starting to make towards utilization of tissue proteomics in the cancer clinic. It's been known for many decades, um, more, more than four decades, that measuring just one protein, uh, namely the estrogen receptor, is enough to give very important predictive value in the situation um, uh, of breast cancer. So if one protein, the estrogen receptor is present, um, this is predictive of a response to an anti-estrogen treatment. If you add in a second protein, a progesterone receptor, that slightly improves the prediction accuracy. And of course there are a small number of other proteins which have subsequently been um, uh, measured, um, including HER2, which predicts response to HER2 inhibitors, um, uh, the kinase inhibitors or blocking antibodies. So one of the um, big gaps in the information which is available to cancer clinicians at the moment is proteomic data. There have been amazing advances that have been made in genomics and um, genomic and transcriptomic data um, are starting to be used quite widely in clinical decision-making, um, but proteomics um, on a large scale um, has yet to make it to the cancer clinic. Uh, a medical oncologist, uh, one of the medical oncologists is working um, on this project with us, um, Emma Boys, um, recently reviewed um, all of the literature that we could identify, um, looking for what clinical applications there are of mass spectrometry based proteomics in, in the cancer clinic. And the conclusion was that um, there are very few, you know, with some limited exception, um, mass spec based proteomics has not yet been implemented in routine clinical practice. And that obviously raises the question, why should that be? And, um, and it comes down to a number of factors. One of them is um, reproducibility um, from lab to lab. 
um, the um, lack of preparative techniques um, that are suitable for routine clinical use. And because a lot of the studies of the proteomics of cancer haven't actually been designed to answer clinical questions. They've given um, uh, excellent insights into the proteome um, of, of cancer, um, but um, a lot of those studies have not been designed to answer clinical questions. So other major ventures um, in this area um, include uh, CPTAC, um, which is um, uh, funded by the, the NCI pr primarily, uh, multiple institutions um, in the US, um, and um, a large number of high impact, you know, excellent scientific uh, publications. Um, and um, one of those is illustrated here, um, 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 a, a cell paper on the proteogenomics of squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. And that extends beyond the United States through the International Cancer Proteogenome uh, Genome Consortium, or ICPC, um, of which we're uh, very proud to be a part. In fact, um, Australia uh, was the first country to sign an MOU with the NCI um, uh, for this collaboration. And, and more than a dozen other countries have joined since. So a very nice international collaboration. We've taken um, um, an approach which is really focused on delivering proteomics into the cancer clinic. And that's what I want to take you through, you know, what progress that we've made towards that um, in, in my presentation today. So at some point in the diagnostic journey for a cancer patient, um, it's almost inevitable, so it's not quite 100%, but in almost every case, um, the initial cancer treatment does not begin until a piece of tissue, um, you know, either excision of, of the tumor or a biopsy is examined down the microscope um, by histopathology. The most widespread um, technique for doing this is that the tumor sample um, is formal and fixed and paraffin embedded, um, which is a technique that uh, pathologists have been using since the 1890s and it works extremely well. Um, it's a very nice medium uh, for getting uh, slides, um, you know, sections to go on slides that are very suitable for uh, staining and histopathological examination. So what we set ourselves the task of doing was developing um, the, um, uh, the processes for um, obtaining a good quality proteomic data from FFPE tumor sections, um, and to do that in a time frame that would allow um, it to be possible for the proteomic data um, to reach the cancer clinician at around the same time um, as the report on the histopathology. So typically something like a minimum of about 36 to 48 hours. Um, uh, so that the initial treatment, uh, so that that information would be available at the time um, the initial treatment plan is being considered. And then, of course, it's one thing to develop the technology, um, but um, um, it, it's another major step um, to have the knowledge base that's needed in order to interpret the proteomic data um, for the benefit of the um, clinician and, and, the, and the patient. So that was, that's the task that we set ourselves, first of all, to develop clinically relevant high throughput proteomic technology, and then to build a pan-cancer database of proteomic and clinical outcome data on a single platform. Um, to do this, we um, have brought together a, a multidisciplinary team um, that include anatomical pathology, um, proteomics, obviously, uh, software engineering, data science, um, strong project management. And I'll come back to this point, but we've been, been very fortunate to have a number of fully qualified medical oncologists um, involved in this project full time. 
I won't go through the details of this, but just this illustrates a few important points um, about the property pipeline. Um, for the projects that we're doing, uh, we always like to have um, a histopathology section immediately adjacent to the section that goes into the mass spec um, so that we know, um, you know, so we're able to visualize that portion of the block um, that goes into the mass spec um, so we can you know, be certain the, as to its uh, tumor content, um, the extent of the necrosis, um, tumor infil um, lymphocytic infiltration, et cetera. Um, we uh, batch randomize um, and then go through a, a process of flash heating um, to inactivate proteases, um, bead beating to disrupt the, the, the um, uh, membranes and so on, um, pressure cycling to liquefy the sample, um, you know, lysis, various chemical modifications, um, a column cleanup, and, and that essentially produces then a purified solution of peptides, cryptic peptides, uh, which go into the mass spec. Um, and then that's processed through a, um, a, a software pipeline to produce a list of peptides, which gets rolled up to a list of proteins. Um, and then, of course, the, the sorts of analyses that you would expect um, get done. We've put a lot of emphasis on um, quality control um, because this is absolutely fundamental um, uh, to building a knowledge base. Um, and again, won't go through the details of this, but uh, we run bovine sil uh, serum albumin um, at very frequent intervals um, and analyze the results in real time. And if there's any problem with the data, um, uh, then the mass spec run stops um, uh, un until the problem is corrected. And similarly, um, we also run more complex controls, namely HEC 293 cells. So we've um, made very large batches um, of HEC 293s uh, because they can be grown in suspension culture. Um, and then we run them um, as controls on every mass spec every day um, uh, to continually check on their performance. So over the uh, four year period, um, we've done 31,000 BSA mass spec runs um, and 7,000 HEC uh, mass spec runs um, you know, for the purpose of um, continually uh, doing quality control. One of the studies that we've um, published so far, and, and most of our data are, um, are, are still unpublished, but um, one of the studies that we've, we have published um, is a study to demonstrate the reproducibility of the methods um, over time and across multiple instruments. Um, I won't go through the details of this because um, it, it was published in 2020, um, but essentially what we did was run a block of defined biologically distinct samples um, at intervals on six different mass specs over a period of four months. And interspersed with those was um, 5,000 mass spec runs um, of other samples. So essentially, uh, we were simulating real world lab operating conditions um, with all of the major cleans and uh, you know, minor repairs and so on um, that are necessary to mass specs um, in, in the meantime. Um, and um, what we were able to show was that um, we we're able to develop appropriate normalization methods um, without losing data um, that obtains over time and across six instruments um, uh, reproducible data. Um, uh, from a you know, battery of mass specs operating 24 seven under real world conditions. In addition, we've done a study of reproducibility of the data um, over a number of years. And this just il illustrates um, that samples um, from three of our cancer cohorts, you know, rerun after various time points um, on all six mass, uh, mass spec, spec instruments, um, um, you know, varying intervals between them, you know, ranging from a few days to 1170 days at the maximum um, 
uh, the, um, um, the the results cluster together, um, in, indicating that the data are reproducible over a long period of time. So we consider that it's not to say that we're finished um, uh, continuing to develop the data and uh, sorry the, the the methodology and of course there are many other labs um, developing mass spec methodology as well. But we're now at the point where we consider um, that we have the elements in place to start building large scale uh, cancer proteomic data because data can be now acquired continuously over long periods of time. Um, the data can be harmonized from multiple instruments. Um, and I haven't mentioned this, but data can be obtained from samples that have been stored in different ways. So fresh frozen, uh, stored in OCT medium um, or um, FFPE. Um, uh, so many um, different types of, of samples can be brought together on the same platform um, to generate um, large scale data. So it's a scalable um, set of techniques. So um, that's um, what I'll go through very briefly next. And that's our steps towards building a pan cancer database of proteomic and clinical outcome data. And the way we've done this is one clinical scenario at a time. Um, um, and I've illustrated this here. So early stage ER positive breast cancer um, is, is one clinical scenario where uh, we have cohorts of samples that are designed to, to answer questions um, about that clinical scenario. And then of course, you know, there's early stage HER2 positive breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, metastatic ER positive breast cancer. Um, and um, um, we're um, building the database um, a, a scenario at a time, uh, both with test cohorts and validation cohorts. You know, similarly for prostate cancer, uh, the clinical scenario is different for localized versus metastatic. And of course, once it's metastatic, um, very often the prostate cancers become resistant um, to attempts to modulate androgen uh, levels. Um, uh, so that's another distinct um, clinical scenario. Then, um, you know, intracranial tumors and um, extracranial um, uh, uh, neural related uh, tumors um, and, and many other tumor types. Um, I mentioned that we um, are endeavoring to have a very strong clinical focus in this program. I mentioned Emma Boys, um, the medical oncologist who um, did the review. Um, of where we are at the moment with mass spec based proteomics in the cancer clinic. Um, we also have Adela Ref, um, Liz Connolly, Veronica Young, uh, all of whom are board certified oncologists. Uh, Veronica is a pedi pediatric oncologist um, who are working full time in, in this program. Um, I also um, highlight Karen McKenzie, um, who's a senior investigator who's very experienced in leukemia research. Um, and Jia Lu, who's another medical oncologist who worked with us um, full time uh, for a period, is now back in the clinic treating cancer patients and running clinical trials uh, that continues to be very important to, to the project. And then in addition, we have um, a large number of collaborating teams who are working with us, and many, uh, probably most of them, uh, led or at least co-led uh, by uh, cancer clinicians. Um, or um, uh, research pathologists. Um, so the project designs are all clinically focused um, and our medical oncologists help us to make sure they stay that way. Um, and they're also responsible for helping us to acquire the tumor samples and the clinical data um, and to guide the data analysis and the interpretation. Um, we have projects um, ongoing in many different types of, of cancer. We currently have 95 research collaboration agreements that are signed and, under, and the research underway. And the majority of these are with groups with, are around Australia, um, 23 of them are international, um, uh, all in the Northern Hemisphere, in countries that have got um, medical systems that are more or less similar to our own. 
uh, which makes it just much more easy um, to um, uh, you know compare outcomes um, when the the treatments are likely to be um, uh, fairly similar and you know help the, the, the care is likely to be similar. Um, so North America, um, uh, many countries in Western Europe and the UK, um, and also Japan. Um, so the experimental design for each of these uh, cancer cohorts um, is that the, the cohort is um, assembled to answer a high value clinical question, often identified by our collaborators. Um, the minimum requirement is that it must have suitable associated clinical data, um, outcome data. Um, we prefer um, to study cohorts for which there's other omic data so that we can compare and contrast and, and, and put the various levels of omic data together. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, we are looking for both test and validation cohorts. This is just one example. So this is papillomavirus positive oropharyngeal um, squamous carcinoma. We've worked with collaborators in Brisbane um, uh, who've assembled a cohort of 124 such patients. Um, and um, we identified nearly 6,000 proteins in, the, in these samples. We identified those that are associated with recurrence-free survival, um, used um, fairly standard um, computational techniques to find a 15 protein signature, um, which correlates, which is predictive of recurrence-free survival. And you can see that the patients um, have segregated into three groups that we're calling low risk of recurrence, intermediate risk, and very high risk um, of recurrence. And this is of a potential clinical significance um, uh, because those that are low risk um, it, it, it would almost certainly be desirable to de-escalate um, the chemo radiotherapy treatment um, that these patients get in addition to surgery. And I mentioned um, this is a very nice collaboration with um, clinicians in Brisbane, um, uh, Australia, um, uh, who are shown on the slide there. Uh, interestingly, um, we've also been exploring this same data set at the peptide level, so not at the protein level, but at the peptide level, and have identified a 26 peptide signature, which performs extremely well um, in terms of predicting recurrence-free survival and overall survival. And I mentioned that because um, those of you um, with expertise in mass spectrometry um, uh, will agree that the process of of um, generating a panel proteomic data um, is simplified um, if it's um, at the peptide level rather than the protein level. Another example, and this is the last one I'll give, um, uh, could multiply many examples of this kind. So this is another study which is closer to home for many of you. Um, it's a cohort uh, from the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and our collaborators here are uh, Kurt Harris from the Lab of Human Carcinogenesis um, and Eitan Rupin um, uh, uh, on the bioinformatics side. And we were able to identify a 12 protein risk score, uh, which characterizes early stage lung cancer patients into high and low risk um, of death from lung cancer. So that's the minimum requirement um, proteome and clinical data. Um, I mentioned we like to, to get hold of any other associated data that we can, including telomere biology data, um, because that's one of my major um, other interests. Um, um, okay, so the, the various cohorts are heterogeneous in the amount of other data um, that's available. Um, in addition to tumor tissue, um, we're interested in collecting data on model systems as well, organoids, cancer cell lines, and patient-derived xenografts, um, because you can do so many more, you can get so much more um, experiments done um, on the lower complexity model systems. This is a study that was published last, last year, um, so I'll just mention it very briefly, but um, we added proteomics to the Sanger collection of cell lines for which there's already um, lots of other omic data, um, cancer um, gene vulnerability, 
um, screens, so dependency maps, um, and sensitivity to 625 drugs. Um, interestingly, we were able to do random down sampling of the proteins and show that um, um, it's a relatively small number of proteins which is required to be highly predictive of um, the outcome of, tr of drug treatment. And um, the proteins, as you might expect, that are most predictive are those that are commonly expressed with highly interconnected networks. And so they're the, um, a relatively small number of those are able to predict drug response with high confidence. Um, um, we've done some studies to see whether, to what extent the cell lines can represent the cancer tissue. Um, so this is a, a study that's unpublished at the moment where we looked at 975 cell lines, um, um, and nearly 1,300 um, uh, tissue samples. Um, and then we've put that together in an online machining, a machine learning workflow where we trained the model on the, on the cancer cell lines in a small amount of tumor data. And then we progressively added in small amounts of additional um, tumor data. And in terms of predicting the, the cancer type, you can see that there's a rapid um, increase um, to you know, up to you know, well over 96, 97% um, accuracy of predicting cancer type when you add in small amounts of additional um, um, uh, tumor data, real tumor data um, to the online machine, machine learning model. Sorry, it's late at, late at night here. Um, tripping over my words. Um, okay, so um, this is where we are. We're building a knowledge base now of proteomic clinical and, and other data. Um, and um, I'm out of time. Uh, so I will acknowledge um, uh, the people in, in the team um, who've been doing all of this work. And we have many, many other collaborators, but the, um, the, the collaborators who uh, whose um, collaborative project I've presented tonight um, in, include uh, Kurt Harris um, and Eitan Rupin um, and our collaborators in Brisbane on the oropharyngeal uh, project. And um, the funding for this has come, uh, I think, entirely from Australia, from a variety of um, funding agencies um, that are listed here. And of course, without them, this project would not happen. So thank you for your interest, and I will be happy to take some questions in the time that's left. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, we have uh, two questions uh, in uh, the chat and in the uh, Q&A. One is, would expanding the indications of the proteomics diagnostic lab beyond oncology potentially facilitate translation to clinical practice, for example, address economic barriers? Um, the the only barrier to expanding it is the availability of tissue um, uh, for tissue proteomics. But of course, um, there's no re uh, so we um, have not yet established a pipeline um, for uh, plasma or serum proteomics. Um, but there are labs that, of course, have got that uh, very well worked out. Um, so it. it you know, the only barrier is the type of tissue which is available or, or fluids, you know, biofluids. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I anticipate that this can be rolled out um, in many, many different clinical scenarios, not just cancer. Thank you. And the second question is from Nathan Basisti. So Nathan, do you want to ask yourself your question? Sure, yes, thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you, uh, Roger. My question, I had one, um, I had a few questions actually, but one I put in the chat, um, I was, it was interesting that you did the peptide level biomarker signature. I think that's an interesting approach. And I was wondering, is that, um, how does that perform if you put it head to head versus like a protein level signature? And a follow-up question on that is, you know, do the peptides that you, that were part of your 26 peptide signature, did they map to any of the proteins in your protein level signature? Okay, so in, um, the peptide signatures appear to do at least as well as the protein signatures. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily map, um, you know, um, they don't necessarily map 
um, to the the writing writing signature, which is you know intuitively what you would expect, yeah, um, because of the way the machine learning is is done. Because essentially, what what you're looking for is the smallest set of either proteins or peptides, which are predictive of whatever outcome that you're looking for. Um, so mm -hmm. those proteins or those peptides will be representative of a network um, uh, that is predictive. Um, and that you don't necessarily expect um, that, you know, any given protein will be represented by peptides in the peptide signature. Okay. Very interesting. Thanks. Next I'm question. Gonna... Maggie, Maggie Lam, so you can ask it too. Yeah. I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a question. Um, so um, fantastic call. Uh, thank you. Um, would you um, share more insights on um, how technical metadata were designed and recorded and um, which aspects were the most important um, for example, for the correction of batch effects, such as uh, maybe a sample processing operator, uh, time since um, instrument tuning, and, um, and whether there are any lessons that we can take for best practices uh, for smaller scale uh, lab studies. Um, so, I mean, one, one of the factors is to have um, a, a um, you know, a preparative technique which is reliable in, in extracting the proteins and, and peptides. So that's critically important. And, and of course, to have that as a reproducible pipeline. Um, now, um, we, we've got our preparative technique to the point where it is reproducible. Um, you know, what, one of the factors that's been very important and this is you know it, it it's not necessarily something that will need to be continued into the future but one of the things um, one of the factors that really was very helpful in in getting this to be a reproducible technique was barrow cycling um so you know pressure cycling of the tissue and liquefying it and simultaneously doing the, the trips and digestions um, so you know that that I know I just you know that's just one illustration of um, um, the the statement that you know you need to have a, a a set of techniques which gives you reproducible extraction. Um, but in eliminating batch effect um, is is important, but of course you know the more reliable the technique is, um, the the less tendency there will be to batch effect. Um, you know, if it's a highly reproducible um, platform. So next I'm, question. I'm not sure whether I've answered all of your question, Maggie. Yes, thank you so much. Yes. Next question from Carlos Pavan in the chat. Uh, how important is the sample take, I guess, sample, sample collection from patients in the whole reproducibility performance? Um, so I'm not quite sure what that means. Is the sample take? I guess it's about sample collection process and the uh, handling of the samples before actually uh, actual analysis. Yeah, 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 really important question. Um, thank you. Um, we haven't formally, we you know, we haven't done a formal study um, of. Um, um, I mean, it's, it, it's actually quite difficult to design. Um, a formal study of you know the slightly different processes that people use in in different path labs um, of you know formal fixation and paraffin embedding, um, and you know it probably should be done at some point. But um, the our observation is that we get comparable. You know we we've, we've now um, run samples from. Probably a hundred different path labs, um, and we there's no obvious difference in the sample quality, you know, depending on what lab they come from. Um, so that that's that's not an entirely satisfactory answer to the question, but um, 
you know, our impression is that it's not an important, not a particularly important factor. Um, the genomicists have reported that it is um, for them. Um, um, you know, the, the 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 details of the of the fixation methods and so on. Um, but for proteomics, we're not seeing that. Um, okay, and I think there was a second part to the question, though. No, that, that's it. That's it. That was. Yeah. Oh, and so another aspect of this um, is we have done a formal study of the effect of cutting the section and then waiting um, before it's analyzed. Um, and, and again, this is because that does have an effect on immunohistochemistry, uh, which is, you know, you know, by definition, it's um, a, a procedure that's recognizing proteins. Um, we've found um, no differences, no detectable differences in sections that have been cut and then stored for up to nine months. So the techniques seem to be really quite robust um, uh, to you know, that um, aspect of sample handling. Okay, I have one more quick question and I don't see any more questions in any uh, chats or Q and A. So uh, I, I just have a question about the another level of uh, regulation, which is post translational modifications. Uh, do you see any peptides that are modified in cancer? It is very well known that uh, you know often the phosphorylation can be indicative. Um, or do you pl have any plan to look into that? Yes. Um, so having made the decision to. Um, you know, focus as much as possible on um, FFPE. Um, you know, the, the more labile um, phosphate groups are just you know, not not going to be seen. Yeah, yeah, not. Uh, but However, it's just another. Sorry. There are serines and, and you know phosphorylated serines and threonine, which are quite resistant. Um, you know, quite persistent despite. Um, FFPE processing, um, and we are exploring, you know, what information can be extracted from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, not not tyrosine. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk that generated a lot of interest. And have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, um, so our next speaker is um, Dr. Rene Robinson. Uh, Dr. Robinson is professor of chemistry at Vanderbilt University. Um, uh, Rene's uh, research program focuses on aging, Alzheimer's disease, and uh, Rene is the recipient of many awards in the field of chemistry, including the 2016 Talented 12 Award from Chemical and Engineering News. Um, so um, Dr. Robinson is going to share uh, her work with us today on um, high throughput proteomics application in aging and Alzheimer's disease today. Um, so the floor is yours. Thank you, Maggie, and thank you to uh, Hippo for hosting this webinar and also to Alexandra, Matt, Maggie for the organization of it. So today I'm going to share with you um, a snapshot of some of the things that we're currently working on in our laboratory that have to do with primarily Alzheimer's disease applications, but I'll give you an idea of at least one aging um, application that we're working on. Um, before I get into that, though, I would like to take the time to um, acknowledge my group um, who are absolutely um, amazing and contribute to a lot of the projects that I'm going to talk about today and the technology, as well as the funding um, of our work to so those that fund our work. Um, so within the context of Alzheimer's disease, which is one of the more prevalent um, age-related diseases, um, there are some disparities that exist when it comes to looking at individuals across various racial and ethnic uh, backgrounds. Um, in the U.S., African-American populations and Latino-American populations have one and a half to two times um, more likelihood of having Alzheimer's disease than non-Hispanic white um, counterparts. 
And there are many reasons that um, uh, this e exists. And so in, in other talks, I get into that in a bit more detail. Um, however, here I wanted to highlight that a number of uh, comorbidities that also show up in aging populations, such as heart disease, diabetes, and stroke, um, more so increase one's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So when these things are prevalent in underserved populations, um, they just exacerbate uh, the problem. Um, and looking at um, what it is that we know about disease pathogenesis and Alzheimer's disease, as well as looking at um, the, the diversity of clinical research trials and basic science research, um, is becoming more uh, conversational um, and more recognized that there needs to be diversity um, in, in this research space. Um, and so oftentimes marginalized groups who are also disproportionately impacted by the disease are not included um, in these basic research studies. So uh, my lab was interested um, in that several years ago. And so we started down a path of trying to understand at least from a chemical biochemical perspective, what might be some of the things that would contribute to uh, these disparities. So here you can uh, see an example of the pathological differences between a healthy uh, brain and an age matched a brain that comes from someone with advanced Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of shrinkage, um, a lot of neuronal loss and the presence of amyloid beta plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, which are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease that um, we've all heard a lot about. Um, and looking at these hallmarks um, in the context of how they manifest in uh, various racial and ethnic groups, there are a couple of studies that I wanted to highlight. Um, there's one study here on the top, which looked at the prevalence, well, which look at the prevalence of um, Alzheimer's disease in uh, African-American and Caucasian populations. And here they identified that there was more a uh, case of mixed dementia in African-American population. So not only just having Alzheimer's disease, but also infarcts and Lewy bodies. And then here, there are a number of studies that have began to look at the levels of cerebral spinal fluid total tail uh, levels in African-American and non-Hispanic white populations. And so here you can see at the bottom that the baseline levels of uh, CSF total tail in these studies were lower in African-Americans compared to non-Hispanic whites. And so if you're thinking about developing uh, biomarkers that are going to be effective in all parts of the population, you want to know what these baseline levels are so that you can properly um, adjust the, the bio. Uh, the diagnostic level so that um, there aren't groups of individuals that go misdiagnosed or missed. Um, in terms of the basic uh, science research, um, I was really surprised to find that when you look at a lot of the studies, that there's also a lack of inclusion of diverse groups in studies such as proteomics. And so here you can see some examples of some uh, uh, very pivotal proteomic studies that have looked at Alzheimer's disease brain, and the number of non-white participants um, is fairly low. So when we first um, started on this project in my lab, um, we were looking to, uh, to really kind of catch up and get a, a hold of as many uh, postmortem brain tissues and plasma tissues, biospecimens as we could from cohorts that included African-American adults. Um, and so there's a whole um, story behind, you know, having a lack of adequate samples that I don't get to share today. Um, but what we decided to do was really just start with what was available. Um, and we started with what was available at the University of Pittsburgh and the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center there. Um, so I'm going to get into that um, and kind of share what we learned from those studies. Before I do, um, I wanted to share a bit about the technology that has to be in place to really um, start to answer questions about why these disparities might exist. And so our, our prior speaker uh, talked a lot about proteomics and basic pipelines. And so there's um, so many different varieties to this particular image here, which takes you from some tissue base to extraction of proteins to a mass spec analysis. And in my lab, we spend a lot of time doing quantitative proteomics using um, chemical barcodes. So tandem mass tags would be an example of that, where there's three portions of this tag, one that is amine reactive to your peptides, and then the other two portions of the tag that have various um, locations where you can have heavy coated um, isotopes. Um, you can create multiple versions of these tags, and so these are so commercially. Um, and if you tag um, multiple samples with one of these various isobaric reagents, 
then you can combine them together and do a multiplex mass analysis. And so once you do tandem mass spectrometry, you have the ability to then um, know which peptide signal is coming from a given uh, sample based on the reported iron level and abundance, and that's indicated here. And so in these um, uh, experiments, typically you can do anywhere from uh, six to 18 tags, which are commercially available, and there are other in-house versions that people have created that go up to maybe 21 plex. Um, but in our lab, what we did was to um, double or enhance the multiplexing efforts. And one of the ways that we did that was to incorporate another layer of labeling, which is called precursor dimethylation labeling, um, and uh, lower the pH of the buffer condition so that we could do that specifically um, at the end uh, termini of peptides. And so we can look at different versions of this tag where we have a light labeled or heavy isotopically labeled version of the dimethyl group. And then by changing the pH of the buffer, uh, the buffer, then we're able to selectively add the TMT tags onto lysine residues. And so we have various iterations of this technology, a C palette that we've developed through the years, and we can go anywhere from 12 to uh, 42 um, plex uh, sample multiplexing. That le work is led by uh, Bailey Bowser in the lab, who is looking for um, opportunities as she's finishing up in the next few weeks. Um, and here's an example of how we can apply their technology in aging and AD. So here we were interested in trying to understand uh, whether or not there are system-wide changes in peripheral organs that occur in Alzheimer's disease that precede changes that happen um, in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. So Bailey um, took this approach for C-Palette and she um, applied it to wild type and APPS1 mouse uh, mice models that uh, started from three months all the way to uh, 12 months. Um, about seven months is when these um, mice start to exhibit amyloid beta deposits, early signs of cognitive impairment, and then that um, progressively gets worse over time. And so um, she applied the C-Pilot approach. Uh, so each experiment has embedded in it multiple tissues, genotypes, biological replicates, um, as well as uh, the genotypes. And so here on the right, you can see a heat map that shows you um, the vast amount of data that we get where we can characterize changes that um, are grouped very specifically based on the tissue type. And so PCA analysis um, shows you that tissue type is a very uh, nice driver of proteomic changes. And then we can look at how these proteins change over time. So as an example, we can pull out a few classical proteins that are important in Alzheimer's disease, like the amyloid precursor protein. And here you can see that one is actually present in all tissues uh, that we examine. So the levels of it are higher in the brain. They um, increase in the brain over time, which we would expect. But there's also uh, the presence of uh, this protein um, in other tissues as well. And you can see that for a number of these other uh, classical proteins. And so what we are able to do with this sort of multiplexing approach is be able to look at uh, the big picture um, of a particular model such as this one and try to understand overall in the uh, animal, across the body and different tissues, um, everything that's taking place. And so these are some very complex experiments. Um, I really like that Dr. Riddell set up the topic of quality control and how important it is to think about doing um, large-scale proteomic samples. And so our team has been working on that as well over the past uh, several years. And we think about quality control uh, beginning as early as like the sample preparation process. And so this just shows you a snapshot of how we think about that for plasma, where at every step of the process, we have some sort of um, sample that is reporting on the performance. So for protein depletion, we use um, a standard human uh, plasma aliquot that comes from um, Sigma, it's a commercial one. Um, and we generate uh, a lot of that, that we deplete. We know exactly where it elutes. We know um, what it should look like in terms of its performance in the mass spec. Um, and then we use it throughout the rest of the protocol when we do digestion, tagging and everything like that to check how efficient the digest is, how efficient the labeling is, how well did fractionation go and so forth and so on, depending on what the actual workflow looks like. Like. 
When the sample gets into the mass spec, we also developed a protocol for being able to evaluate how well things are happening in the mass spec uh, on the course of each day. So Dr. Kari Patterson um, helped establish this in the lab. And here's an example where um, we had a plasma project with, um, I think, 330 plasma samples. Um, but we performed uh, close to 300 QC injections that occurred over the course of the data collection. So that took about um, six months. And here you can see if we just take one metric uh, protein abundance um, for uh, that particular experiment, we have a really good idea of what protein abundance should look like in our plasma uh, standard. Sometimes we'll do this in a plasma standard. We also do it in a pool sample that comes from all of the plasma samples in a given cohort. And anytime a, um, a metric falls out of specification. So here you see a few examples where these are falling out of where our uh, average and two standard deviation level um, exist. Then we know we need to stop and adjust and do something. So we look across um, eight or so different metrics um, that inform us on how well the experiment is going. And then depending on whether or not those uh, samples are passing the metric or not, we either proceed with the analysis or we stop and perform some intervention. And so what we've developed in the lab is a very um, detailed and robust guide and process for users to know what to do when um, samples aren't meeting spec to make sure that we're spending most of our time collecting high quality data on the instrumentation. Okay, so we incorporate the quality control measures in different experiments. And so now I wanna go back to where we started with um, looking at disparities in um, Alzheimer's disease um, by looking at postmortem brain tissues that came from the University of Pittsburgh um, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And this was work that was led by Dr. Caitlin Stepler, and we collaborated with Dr. Tim Homan and Emily um, here at Vanderbilt to do some um, statistical analysis. So we can take various uh, tissue regions that um, we get access to from the center, um, regions that are pathological, such as hippocampus and parietal lobule that also are heavily implicated in cognitive impairment and memory loss in Alzheimer's patients. Um, and then we also look at regions like the globus pallidus that aren't as pathological um, so that we can have a check and balance on our data. We were able to get um, samples that came from African-American and non-Hispanic white individuals. And in this first pilot study, we basically matched the non-Hispanic white participants to what we had available from the African-American participants. And here you can see that if we look across different brain regions, there's um, a signature of proteins that are changing in individuals that have Alzheimer's disease um, in the hippocampus compared to the um, inferior parietal lobule. And then as we hypothesized size, there weren't many changes that were taking place in globus pallidus. And this is when you look at everybody all together in the cohort. So it was um, uh, close to uh, 40, um, 20 individuals in this particular study. Um, then if you look at what these proteins are and the pathways that you're involved in, then you see a lot of the signaling pathways that have to do with uh, 1433 mediation, synaptogenesis, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative phosphorylation, and glycolysis that are changing in the individuals that have Alzheimer's disease. And that's very consistent with what we know about uh, lower glucose metabolism occurring in Alzheimer's patients based on um, PET scans. But really what we wanted to know was whether or not uh, proteins were changing similarly um, in individuals that had Alzheimer's disease in both our non-Hispanic white and African-American participants. And to do that, we looked at a race by diagnosis st statistical regression model. And here what you can see, for example, are proteins whose uh, level are dependent on both uh, the racial uh, background that the participants self-identify as, as well as having a particular diagnosis. And so as an example, AFR2 macroglobulin at the top, you can see um, from the circles, it doesn't change in uh, individuals that have Alzheimer's disease compared to those that don't and are non-Hispanic white participants. However, in the African-American participants, it's lower in expression in the individuals that have Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there are different instances where proteins change the same in both groups. There are instances where there might be an opposite change um, and individuals that have Alzheimer's disease, depending on their racial and ethnic background um, and vice versa. And then there are also these instances where there are subtle changes where um, they change in the same direction, but the baseline level in one group or the other um, might be different. 
So this was the first study that really indicated to us that it was worthwhile to continue looking um, at uh, collecting more samples that came from diverse uh, individuals to better understand disease pathogenesis. And so Jasmine Tyndall is continuing this work in the lab now, and she looked at a second cohort that came from Rush University um, in their Ross map study. And here we had 40 um, individuals, and for each individual, we had three different brain regions, IPL, globus uh, pallidus, and prefrontal cortex. And um, again, when we do these race by diagnosis interactions, you can see that for several uh, proteins that they um, either behave similarly across the two racial groups or their differences that um, show up. And so we um, feel like the methodology is really robust. And so um, we're hopeful that we can start to learn more about uh, disease pathogenesis and figure out what are the key things that really are driving Alzheimer's disease in all um, individuals and what can we learn about um, things that are unique. We also uh, think about this in the context of biomarkers and for Alzheimer's disease, there certainly is a need for developing sensitive and specific biomarkers. Um, the gold standard is to do MRI, uh, MRI scans, which aren't always accessible um, and amenable for underserved populations and the CSF tau measurements that I talked about earlier, um, which can either be done for total tau or for amyloid uh, beta. Um, and so plasma is another, uh, tissue that we think is uh, highly valuable to use um, because it's highly uh, accessible. I mean, it's archived oftentimes in these studies for uh, periods of time that doesn't uh, impact the integrity. Um, but plasma is very challenging to look at. Here you can see that um, it's very heterogeneous. And so we did an uh, analysis of all the um, studies that looked at plasma proteomics and Alzheimer's disease, and we tried to see where they converged on proteins that were different in Alzheimer's disease patients. And, you know, looking across up to six cohorts where thousands of proteins were identified, you can see that there was like only one protein that consistently was showing up, which was that alpha-2 macroglobulin protein. Plasma also has a diversity um, of protein abundances for classical proteins, as well as proteins that are signaling cytokines and um, those that show up at lower concentrations. And so analytically, your approach has to be, be able to address um, the high abundance proteins that often show up. And so we conducted a study using um, African-American and non-Hispanic white uh, participants that had plasma samples from the University of Pittsburgh Center. This was work that was led by um, uh, Dr. Mustafa Khan in the lab. And we created a training set and a test set. And so we had uh, 128 total plasma samples from um, that particular study. We subjected them to um, Mars depletion. At that time, that was using uh, the human six version of the column. And then the rest was the um, quantitative proteomics approach. And the goal here was to identify proteins that were differentially expressed in individuals that had Alzheimer's disease. Um, next, use machine learning to determine the utility of differentially expressed proteins as diagnostic biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease, and then see how well the models perform based on the racial background of the participants. And for the machine learning, Dr. Heather Desir at Kansas University um, uh, helped with those analyses. So um, the proteomics data that we got from the plasma was very reproducible across all the TMT batches that it took us to uh, run to get um, the data across all participants. And similarly, we were able to detect um, proteins across uh, a range of concentrations um, with the mass spectrometry based on what we expected from um, a theoretical, um, or not theoretical, but known uh, concentrations of uh, these classical um, proteins in plasma. So with plasma, at this time, we had um, identified uh, hundreds of uh, proteins, and what we focused on were proteins that were present in a majority of the patients in the study. So once you start filtering out proteins um, based on that criteria alone, then you can see that there's a lower number that end up being present in at least 75% of individuals. But those were the proteins that we uh, moved forward into our um, analysis for the machine learning. So when we looked at proteins that were different in um, everybody uh, that had Alzheimer's disease, um, that's what's shown here with the volcano plot on the left. And then we can stratify based on the racial ethnic background of the participants. And you start to notice some um, um, changes in which proteins are really driving what we saw in the Alzheimer's disease. 
And so we played around with different um, machine learning models where either we would take proteins that were differentially expressed in everyone or in non-Hispanic white or African-American groups. And we uh, use that in the um, model. We also added to the model other variables um, that were associated with the participants. So things such as sex, age, years of education, and APOE status. And when we um, started with just the uh, small set of proteins that were differentially expressed in everybody and put into the model, what you see here on the left in set one for all samples is that we had about a 68% um, accuracy of predicting individuals that had Alzheimer's disease. When we add the clinical variables, the predictions would increase. Um, but what we also noticed is that the performance of the machine learning generally was always um, higher in the non-Hispanic white participants than the African-American participants that we had. Um, and this was even when we took proteins that were um, only differentially expressed in the African-American black group. Also, the clinical variables didn't seem to have as much of an impact in the African-American group. And so that um, gave us some indication that, um, you know, we really need to think about what specific clinical variables and what specific uh, proteins we were using to drive our model for uh, predicting Alzheimer's disease. And so for that, we then went back and looked in the literature across some of those um, proteomics studies that I mentioned earlier that had um, some participation of uh, other groups, um, other racial and ethnic backgrounds. So here we have individuals that are African-American, Black, non-Hispanic, White, Hispanic, and then other, which is this other box that is uh, that was checked, um, which could include Asian-American, uh, Native American, multiracial uh, individuals. So we took these um, data sets. Um, most of these data sets came from using TMT approaches. Um, and we looked across about 10,000 different proteins and we had to select uh, which features we were gonna use to train the model. And so we started with two to 20 of the most abundant features. And then we uh, used that data set as our training data set. And then our work that we had from um, Pittsburgh, we used that as the test set. Um, and what we found was that um, if you uh, look across all the data sets, APP was uh, highly uh, able to predict who had Alzheimer's disease, um, regardless of who you were in the cohort. But we noticed that as the diversity of the cohorts increased and you had more African-American individuals in the cohort, the heat shock protein beta-1 also became a really great uh, predictor of who had Alzheimer's disease. And so again, um, this was analysis that um, confirmed the point that you need to make sure you have diverse representation um, if you're working on biomarker discovery efforts. Um, but I just wanted to highlight like that these are very complex um, problems to work on. And so um, I don't want anyone to be misled that there are biological differences that show up just due to race, because race is a social construct that's been uh, created um, to inf uh, really to enforce these inequities that um, exist in our society. And so there's so many different factors that also have to be considered when we're doing these um, studies that have to look at the interplay of genetics with environmental factors and lived experiences of the participants to really understand what the context of this kind of proteomic um, data mean. And so with that, I hope I've um, shown you a little bit about how we're developing high throughput proteomics technologies and using them to study Alzheimer's disease in diverse populations, um, how we can learn more about the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease by making sure we're being inclusive, and also how we should think about um, biomarker um, efforts um, using uh, tissues such as plasma um, and Alzheimer's disease proteomics. So with that, thank you again for the invitation to present, and I'm happy to answer um, any questions. Uh, thank you, Rene. We have first question from Birgit, who wrote it, but can also say it herself. Right, thank you. Rene, that was such a fantastic talk. I've so much enjoyed it. I have so many questions, but I, I'll stick to a few. <laughs> I, I was wondering, uh, the participants that were chosen, did they also, were they allowed to have comorbidities, uh, you know, or were those excluded who had comorbidities, maybe, as my first question? Yeah, so for these initial studies, we didn't exclude anyone that had comorbidities because we were limited to what we actually had available from the African-American participants. Mm -hmm. So there are some number of individuals that have hypertension or high cholesterol, which mm -hmm. is 
pretty common in a lot of the individuals that have Alzheimer's disease. There's at least about 30% um, mm -hmm. of them that have that. Okay. Um, so we don't have enough numbers to exclude. Mm -hmm. um, but the things that we do exclude are um, cancer or like HIV, AIDS or things that are severely compromised. We'll exclude from the plasma analysis. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Maybe a quick follow up uh, study. As you were talking, I was also actually thinking, I mean, do you think that the uh, racial disparities in diseases and biomarkers, do you think um, that this is actually true in a lot of other diseases also? Um, you know, and I mean, you focus on the AD, but I can see that maybe being a problem in many different diseases or osteoarthritis, or you mentioned a few on some of your early slides. Um, do you know about that? Or what are your speculations? <laughs> yeah, I think there's some cases where it's, it's relevant. So when you think about certain uh, cancers, like breast cancers, there's some forms that are more aggressive in certain parts of the population. Um, things like kidney disease, that um, there's some genetic alleles that make certain groups more uh, you know, predisposed to having those diseases. So I don't think it's applicable to every disease, but I also think that like, we don't know because we haven't looked. Right. <laughs> well, that, would, that would be, uh, you know, my answer. Um, I do know that we study uh, sepsis in my laboratory as well. And there, there are disparities in uh, mortality rates from individuals that have um, sepsis. Don't know how much of that is biological as much as it is quality of care, access to care, treatment of care when you get to the hospital, depending on who you are. Um, however, we are able to detect differences in like a uh, host response that show up in different racial and ethnic groups. Um, and so I think it's important to look for those. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bridget. Okay, question in the chat from Ed Lau. Thank you for the great presentation. Can you tell us more about the current detection limit concentration of plasma proteins for mass spec workflows? Do the quantitative results of the lower abundance proteins present a more severe reproducibility challenge? Yes, I think our current instruments are really, really good um, in terms of the mass spec performance. And so we can get down to zeptimal levels of peptide signals with the instrumentation that we have. Um, and so I think depending on how much um, comprehension you want to put into like the sample workflow will determine like your ability to actually see some of those proteins uh, by the mass spec, but the mass spec can certainly detect them if you fractionate things clean up in that regard. Um, for the second part of the question, so we get pretty uh, good reproducibility of proteins that even have lower uh, concentrations. Um, I think when you're looking at proteins that are getting really close to the signal to noise limits of the instruments, then that's where it becomes more challenging to get good data from those. But when you start looking across several hundreds of individual samples and you're running them multiple times in the instruments, um, you still have a really good, um, you know, really good signal that you can get from even these low abundant uh, cytokine proteins and things like that. So thank you for that question. And the next question from Vincent Richard, uh, really nice work. Do you also look at protein R isoforms, for example, APOE4? Yeah, so we're able to look or measure APOE4 in a lot of our studies. Um, when we're doing like the machine learning, we include that as one of our clinical uh, variables that we build into our machine learning models. So we'll report on like the um, APOE4 status of the participants. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I have I have a short question about something that you mentioned in one of your slides that for some of the differential uh, uh, proteins the baseline was different. Uh, so and, and the baseline can be different between ethnicities or other other groups. And so, uh, do you think that it may be actually important to to change uh, um, change the levels that are uh, indicative of uh, some some kind of disease or uh, predictive of disease for specific groups so that they are not all the time universal like you know you know and it, it it's not only about alzheimer but about anything like they they say you have cholesterol above 200 it's horrible but maybe for some people it's less horrible because their baseline would be different right yeah and, no i think that's a really good point um alexandra and i think because we don't look 
for what the baseline is and we assume that it should be the same for everybody, then I think we, you know, exclude misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, don't diagnose, overprescribe, underprescribe individuals for a number of different like conditions. So I think it's at least worthwhile to make sure that we're, you know, we have a diversity of individuals and we're interested in racial ethnic background, but it could be anything. It could be socioeconomic status, education level. Um, you know, I think all these things are necessary because really the the ability to move forward, like personalized medicine, really makes sure that we have, relies on us making sure we have really good understanding of what baselines are for any one individual, but for groups. Um, and even within our African-American group and non Hispanic white groups, they're not generalizable, right? So we have, you know, people that look like the other other group. We have people that have Alzheimer's disease that was di clinically diagnosed, but they actually look more like the healthy individuals based on the proteome. Um, and I think that's the beauty of what we do with proteomics measurements is we um, have a unbiased way that we can um, phenotype uh, individuals um, and establish those baselines. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And thanks for the great talk. Um, Thank you. So... Uh, I don't see any more questions, so I think we can move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Maggie Lam. Uh, Maggie uh, is Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Medicine and Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And uh, she is focusing on uh, a number of research directions, uh, biology as well as methodology and te technical aspects of mass spectrometry. Uh, her biology research is uh, in uh, aging, especially in cardiology. And uh, today uh, she will talk about post-transcriptional regulation of aging and diseases. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, <laughs> Alexandra. Um, so, okay, let's see. Okay, so um, on the screen, um, you're seeing um, predictive structures um, from two alternative isoforms um, that arise from the same gene. Um, that's called um, BCL to like one gene um, through alternative splicing. So on the left of the white version here um, is um, the longer isoform that's called BCLXL. And on the right hand side is the shorter version that's called BCLXS. So they only differ by a short stretch of about 60 amino acids due to an alternative five prime splice side defense. And that actually led to the removal of the BH1 and BH2 domains on the shorter version. So the very fascinating aspect of these two proteins is that even though they are encoded from the same gene, one promotes cell death and the other is actually anti-apoptotic. And this is an example of how alternative isoforms uh, can serve very uh, different and even opposing functions. Um, so let's start um, from the beginning of what alternative splicing is. Um, so the general idea of alternative splicing is this. Uh, during mRNA transcription, the splice usome and other regulatory factors of splicing, they come together to decide on which exon to retain and which exon to discard, and essentially swapping in and out of protein functions like cassettes. And there are five major types of alternative splicing events, um, including skipped exon, alternative five prime splice sites, alternative three prime splice sites, uh, mutually exclusive exons, and retained intron. Um, so alternative isoforms from the same gene can be as different in their function of uh, regulation, localization, and interacting partners as proteins from separate genes. So um, uh, alternative isoform is a huge source of unknown information about the proteome. And um, the DSCAM gene from Drosophila uh, represents one of the uh, most extreme examples of the possibilities uh, offered by alternative splicing. So the Drosophila melanogaster Down syndrome cell adhesion molecule gene, uh, the DSCAM gene, contains 95 alternative exons that are organized into four clusters of 12, 48, 33, and two exons each. And which um, with the 
given combinations of them, they can generate up to 30,000 possible splicing patterns and isoforms. And um, DSCAM is known to be essential for normal neural circuit development. And it's been reported that the regulation of alternative splicing uh, plays an important role in determining the specificity of neuronal wiring. And um, since a couple of years ago, our lab has been working on the development and improvement of workflow to identify and validate alternative protein isoforms uh, at the omic scale. And um, we developed and utilized an um, RNA-seq guided proteomics approach to help us identify the protein alternative isoforms. So um, with this um, workflow, um, instead of using conventional uh, protein sequence database, uh, we create a computational pipeline um, to translate RNA -se transcript sequences to protein sequences specific to our sample of interest to serve as sample specific database to identify protein isoforms. And the reason behind this is that um, alternative isoforms can manifest under only specific conditions, for example, um, during disease progression or in uh, different developmental stages. So traditional databases derived from, let's say, translating the healthy genome may not uh, contain many alternative isoform sequences uh, for alternative protein uh, identification um, or for the ones that only express under um, certain disease conditions. So on the slide is a version of our workflow to translate RNA-seq data to be used as sample-specific uh, protein databases in um, our proof-of-concept study. Uh, we begin with aligning RNA-seq um, data to reference genomes uh, using the software STAR, and we then use a software called RMETS to extract alternative splice junction information. And after which we apply a software written by us named JCAST uh, to complete a few tasks. First, it retrieves nucleotide sequences directly from ensemble based on the RMET's uh, splice junction output. Second, it translates these nucleotides um, from transcripts um, into um, amino acid sequences in silico. Third, it performs filtering to remove sequences that contain premature stop codons or with very low RNA read counts. And it's in its final steps, it generates a sequence database that's specific to the sample uh, for us to search a matching proteomics data with. So um, our proof of concept work uh, was um, to apply this workflow on and reanalysis of public RNA-seq and mass spectrometry data sets that comprised um, about 80 million mass spectra. Uh, we obtained the proteomics data sets from PRIDE and the RNA-seq data sets from the ENCODE repository. And these data sets were reanalyzed, um, uh, th that we reanalyzed includes uh, data from 19 subanatomical regions of the heart, as well as other major organs, uh, such as liver and lungs. And this reanalysis was published um, in 2019. And on top of identification, we also performed a quantitative analysis based on spectral counts to help assess the expression patterns of the identified alternative protein isoforms. Um, generally, um, we observed uh, four distinct patterns from the quantification analysis. And starting from the top, we observed that some isoforms are very specific to almost only one particular tissue type. For example, a titan isoform is found only in the human heart, but not any other tissues that we've looked at, suggesting a very strong specificity for the heart. And a second uh, type of behavior is that for some proteins, a, only a subset of tissues um, expresses the protein, uh, the alternative isoforms. Uh, for example, in um, LRBA, um, protein, the alternative isoforms were not found to be expressed in the heart at all, uh, or the uh, mesophagus, lung, and spleen, spleen, but it is expressed in all other tissues. And thirdly, some alternative isoforms tend to be expressed across different tissues, but um, to various degrees. 
Um, for example, this is the case for the protein AP2A2, uh, myosin 10, and AP1B1 uh, displayed um, on the third row here. And lastly, there are some complex and resolved patterns with multiple isoforms uh, of the proteins that are present across multiple tissues at various levels. And so on this slide, uh, we are showing an example of the protein myomessin, where the gray region is the alternative region that is removed in a skipped exon alternative splicing event. Um, and the y-axis of the chart is the predicted sequence disorder. And you can see the skipped exon uh, removes a preferentially a disorder region of the protein. And this is consistent with pre previous work that found that most alternative isoforms don't tend to disrupt conserved protein family, uh, protein domains families. However, this was cited as evidence against the function of alternative isoforms at the protein level. And however, we now know that that intrinsically disordered regions or IDR of proteins um, actually play important roles in functions as well. And in addition, in addition, we've also found evidence that IDR intersects with protein post-translational modification sites, uh, presumably maybe because these regions are more accessible to the PDM readers and writers. And in this particular instance, we noticed that there is a significant enrichment of known phosphorylation sites in the alternative regions um, using Fisher's exact tests. And so with the inclusion and removal of amino acid sequences by alternative splicing, um, additional PTM sites can be added or removed and further making the proteome more complex with perhaps up to millions of proteoforms that can be generated because of that. And as you can see, uh, we can go from uh, one gene to multiple alternative isoforms to multiple uh, PTMs on these isoforms. So alternative splicing investigation really presents a trove of information for biomarker discovery. And so with our RNA-C guided workflow, uh, we used it to study the impact of alternative splicing on um, iPSC cells um, to uh, their differentiation to cardiomyocytes um, as our first foray into the study of aging and development. So um, our workflow was applied to understand cardiac differentiation in the context of splicing using a human iPSC cardiomyocyte differentiation protocol as depicted on the left. And we obtained these cells from the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute Biobank. Um, and in order for us to obtain splicing information, we had to perform deep sequencing to about 100 million reads um, at date 0 to 7 and 14 of the differentiation stages using short read RNA-seq. And these states correspond to iPSC, a mesoderm cardioprogenitor, and cardiomyocyte stages. And we generated custom databases uh, using our workflow based on them. And on the proteomic side, we profiled um, every day from day zero to day 14 of the differentiation process in three different uh, iPSC cell lines. Uh, we utilized TMT labeling, uh, which uh, Dr. Robinson Rene has done a really great uh, job explaining the technology. Uh, so to obtain uh, quantitative proteomics information. And from these data, uh, we observed um, distinct patterns of protein isoform expressions uh, during different stages of differentiation in general. And as can be seen in this upper uh, left-hand corner, uh, some isoforms, they decrease in abundance uh, at the cardiomyocyte stage, and some express um, higher abundance during the cardiac progenitor stage, and some are more consistently expressed throughout um, over days of differentiations. 
And from our data, we also found that if we reduce the protein expression profile into two dimension with UMAP um, as this way in this lower panel. Um, so samples from different cell stages um, actually clustered together. And so it means that the cell type specification can be differentiated based on protein isoform expression alone. And um, following our study on iPSC differentiation, our second project related to development and aging is on a set of mouse model experiments to compare the effects of both age and sex on baseline cardiac transcripts and proteins and their isoform expression in, in the mouse hearts. And um, as, as you know, biological age is actually a huge risk factor for heart diseases. And at the same time, most heart diseases have a strong element of sexual dimorphism. And there is also a sex by age interaction, meaning that the effect of sex is dependent on age and vice versa. Also, it's documented that young women are more protected from heart diseases while older women suffer strong cardiac decline. And interestingly, it's reported to be the same in many male models. So in our study, we compare um, male and female of C57 mice as both four months old uh, versus um, um, 20 months old, uh, which correspond to um, uh, young adult and aging mice, respectively. And so 20 months old mice, um, they're documented to correspond roughly to the seventh decade of life in humans based on survival rate analysis and are commonly used to model the onset of aging. And as in our IPSC study, we integrated RNA-seq and shock and proteomics to look at different gene expression as well as different uh, differential um, splice variants at both the transcript and protein levels. So um, this slide um, shows uh, one of the very interesting results uh, from our study, um, at least to me. Um, it shows that for some of the SRSF um, serine arginine rich splicing factor family of splice factors um, here, generally they are more highly expressed in young female hearts than young male hearts, uh, but they're more repressed in aged female hearts. So these are some of the um, sex-based, sex-biased aging changes that we have observed. And so what is really exciting for us is that a lot of these uh, splice factors have unknown targets, uh, which would be um, uh, very interesting for us um, in our ongoing cardiac aging research. And so with both RNA-seq and proteomics data together, uh, we observed that there, there are some obvious um, discordance between RNA and protein level changes uh, with the um, Pearson's correlation value um, calculated to be only um, 0.31. Uh, when we compared um, the transcriptome and proteome of the four months versus 20 months old mice. Um, so there are genes that increase in mRNA, but decrease in proteins or vice versa, um, as well as genes that decrease in both mRNA and proteins, and those that increase in both mRNA and proteins in young versus um, older mice. And so these um, genes are enriched in um, multiple different processes. Um, for example, genes that are increased in both mRNA and proteins are very much enriched in collagen degradation, uh, ECM proteoglycans, and other extracellular um, processes. Whereas genes that show discordant changes that are increasing mRNA but decreasing proteins include uh, genes that are enriched in metabolic proteins, mitochondrial translation, and respiration. And so from these data, we definitely uh, see evidence of post-transcriptional uh, processes and that the transcripts are likely um, regulated uh, post-transcriptionally. And so the transcript level cannot um, really completely predict what's happening at the protein level. So um, in summary, um, we developed a computational pipeline utilizing both transcriptomics and proteomics data 
to discover um, protein alternative isoform. Uh, we applied a pipeline to recover previously hidden alternative isoforms in about 80 million mass spectra from public proteomics data. And we performed our first set of experiments to investigate the changes in the alternative proteomes uh, under uh, different developmental stages, um, covering from um, being iPSC cells to cardiomyocytes to uh, young adult and aging organisms. And we have implemented cardiac differentiation, aging, and sexual dimorphism models to investigate how to develop, um, how the developmental and aging proteomes are regulated by post-transcriptional control mechanisms, uh, such as alternative splicing. And with this, I'd like to um, acknowledge my lab and lab members, uh, our collaborators, as well as funding support from NIH. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Maggie. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, I don't see in the chat. Oh, yeah, I see a question from Birgit. Okay, yeah, wonderful talk. That's amazing. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on the um, data analysis that you're doing, uh, you know, to identify the different isoforms. Are you then also sometimes looking at the peptides that uh, cross the splice junctions or are you doing this um, or, or are you doing any additional validation of some of the more important splice variants? Oh, so, okay, yeah, so we uh, definitely look at um, the peptides across uh, the splice junction, um, and um, we, so basically we start with this um, RNA-seq workflow, we, um, from the RNA-seq, um, we find the um, junction um, uh, region that's present um, through the RMET um, software. And then uh, we have our own software called JCAST that we filtered um, unique peptides that uh, are across splice junction. And um, we, so a lot of the uh, transcripts, even though they're found to be um, under um, uh, alternative splicing, um, they not may not be expressed as um, actual proteins because of the um, post-transcriptional control that degrades um, um, per, uh, a transcript with um, premature stop codon, so such as by the nonsense mediated decay pathway. So we do a couple of um, quality check for those. So within our JCAS pipeline, we would filter out um, peptides that are not um, uh, stitchable um, back to the original canonical isoform based on uh, the unit prod sequence. And we required um, the um, stitching to be aligned to um, 10 overlapping amino acids um, uh, with the canonical sequence. Um, so the canonical sequence, and then it would be the um, alternative junction sequence and then the canonical sequence again. And um, another quality check that we would do is to um, remove um, the RNA-seq with very low read counts. So we um, had different tiers of uh, filtering at the JCAS stage. So we don't actually put them inside um, the um, protein sequence database that we're gonna use to identify uh, alternative isoforms. Um, and well, I mean, we, we try to use a very stringent cutoff, um, such as um, the such as for the FDR or posterior error probability of lower than 0 0.01. And for a lot of those um, identified isoform sequences, we looked at the mass spectra manually as well. And um, lastly, we we are trying to. Um, we, we published a data on it. We um, used um, um, uh, 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 basically PRM to to try to um, look at these peptides um, in a targeted workflow, and um, 
to further validate them with um, orthogonal mass spectrometry techniques. So, so these are some of the things that I can think of right now. Yeah, off the top of my head. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Nathan. Yes, hello. Oh, hi, Maggie. If uh, <laughs> if I may ask a question, that was a, a, a beautiful talk, and I think you know this uh, area of looking at isoforms and uh, different um, splice variants is extremely interesting. I think in aging, and you know, not only because of the biology, you know, like you see these changes in the splice protein machinery themselves. So I think like the it's going to be really interesting to understand the biology of which isoforms change, but also like for biomarkers, right? Like um, having specificity to the isoforms will be potentially increased sensitivity and specificity. So I think super important um, what you're doing and it will be interesting to see in uh, aging like humans. Um, so I had a kind of a technical question that followed from what uh, Birgit uh, mentioned. So I guess it would be a little bit um, hard to have. So per like the number of unique peptides you have per that are isoform specific will probably be reduced. Right, but I mean, in the cases, uh, how much of an issue is that? But also in the cases where you do have isoform specific peptides um, in your models, do they do different isoforms? Like uh, in general, how often do they correlate? You know, the direction of change versus going potentially opposite directions. You know, like during you know IPSC differentiation or aging. You know, are they generally correlating or going in different directions, um, and to what extent? Uh, you, you mean like between the canonical versus the um, alternative, do they go in different directions? Yes. And, um, you know, how, how frequent does that happen? That's a good question. Um, I think. Um, so I, I want to I want to address the 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 the, the unique peptides um, part of it first. Actually, your comments on it. So so we filter um, only unique peptides um, for it. So so um, yeah, you mentioned that it, it could be a challenge when there are like only one peptide that can be mapped to the alternative isoform. So we filter only unique peptides, but um, unique peptides can can be a a problem uh, because more isoforms you have, um, 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 the fewer you will have for unique peptides. And in some peptides that are actually shared by uh, multiple alternative isoforms, but uh, not the canonical forms. And, and so I think this is still an open question in the field of how to deal with that. We can only uh, identify very limited number of isoform peptides in alternative um, proteins. Um, so, um, so I, so, so you asked a very good question. I don't have the answer off the top of my head, uh, with regard to, um, IPSCs, but in, uh, some, um, less related work, uh, we do see some evidence that, uh, some canonical proteins don't differ much between, um, let's say the, um, at the atrium of the heart, uh, versus the ventricle, but the isoforms, they, they do differ. They, they, they're different. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any more questions. So thank you very much, Maggie. Thank and, you. Uh, let's move on. So, okay. So uh, I'm gonna introduce um, Birgit, um, Dr. Schilling. So um, uh, our next speaker is um, Dr. Schilling and Dr. Schilling is professor and director of the mass spectrometry core um, at, at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. And so the Schilling lab uses advanced mass spectrometry uh, technology to understand molecular mechanism that underline aging, including quantitative proteomics, uh, post-translational modification, uh, protein dynamics, and protein market um, discovery. So um, I'll let um, Dr. Schilling um, take it from here. You mute it.
to unmute, I had to unshare, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I will share again now. Thank you so much for such a pleasure to be here today, this morning with such a great group of, um, you know, kind of presenters. I, I very much enjoyed everybody's talk and looking forward to the next talk also. Um, yeah, so I, as you said, I'm at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging and um, I wonder if this is blocking your view here, this little panel, is that okay? Or I can move it over there. Yes, okay, no, that's better, okay. Um, yeah, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about our work in aging, senescence and age-related diseases. It actually fits quite well into uh, also what you just presented, but also what Dr. Robinson and or the speaker before presented. I feel like the, the power of aging research is really how it can relate to so many different diseases. And in my lab, we're actually very focused also on underlying mechanisms of aging that I believe is the reason why so many age-related diseases have similar uh, kind of mechanisms that we may see, and that is actually cellular senescence. So let me show you briefly, this is work, um, you know, like, first of all, this shows you a little bit the pillars of aging here, uh, where it points out, of course, the cellular senescence as part of a very important uh, mechanisms during mechanism during aging. And in my lab, we have been really interested in the SASP, the senescence associated secretory phenotype. And in fact, Nate Persisti, who will speak uh, right next, uh, he actually developed a lot of this together with me. So, but today I want to tell you um, about a specific SASP that is not just the soluble proteins or molecules that will also include lipids or metabolites that go, uh, are released from senescent cells, but also specifically, I would like to address the power and role of extracellular vesicles as part of aging. And it's actually quite interesting. So once uh, cells become senescent, they actually really, um, kind of increase so much what they secrete or release. So it is actually one of the major phenotypes of a senescent cells. And if you think about this, um, you know, this can be quite detrimental for the tissues that are around senescent cells. All of a sudden, upon insult, uh, you know, it may be a stress that induces senescence in, in, in vivo models, right, or aging um, itself um, in, in uh, basically a cell tissue culture model, you can actually induce senescence with various different stressors that I'm listing here. And again, I mentioned that then the senescent cells start to release high amounts of soluble proteins, but also extracellular vesicles. So we're using the tissue culture basically as discovery platform to find out what gets released. And this is published in PLOS Biology by Bassisti et al. in 2020. Uh, we developed this so-called SASP atlas there. And then we're using really what we learn from the in vitro experiments to see if we see any of this, for example, in plasma, um, but also in tissues. We're really interested to see in diseases that affect specific tissues, such as, for example, um, you know, also kidney disease, which of these SARS factors we have identified in in vitro models, which of those do we also see either in plasma or different organs. And then, of course, uh, this will then allow us to kind of really look closer into differentiating, for example, different cohorts. So, for example, young, old, or also if there's any kind of treatment that maybe provides synolysis, meaning selectively um, deleting and killing senescent cells. But does the treatment actually work? So, you know, like doing some plasma proteomics then would allow to see that the treatment work or not, that these uh, senescent cells actually get uh, removed or not. So this is kind of a little bit like an overall workflow we have. Um, and uh, I will show you a little bit some examples here. 
So it was interesting when we initially developed the SASP Atlas, um, you know, we developed uh, so-called what we called core SASP proteins that would show up from any cell types with any inducers. While there is huge heterogeneity in the senescence based on induction, based on kind of time points and temporal aspects, there were these proteins that are really, uh, you know, always showing up. And, and so this actually shows you Nate and myself here looking at some of the data. And we actually connected with Luigi Ferrucci and Toshika Tanaka, a scientist in Luigi's lab. And they had just released like a plasma aging biomarker study from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, where they looked at healthy aging and which markers would actually correspond to aging and which markers would be uh, aging signatures. And it was really super interesting that a lot of those markers were actually part of our core SASP, which actually was what we were hypothesizing before. And I'm actually mentioning a few here. Um, GDF15 is a marker that a lot of other people who look at um, senescence also find, for example, a nascent brasseur at the Mayo Clinic, um, but many other um, investigators too. And then, of course, a lot of these proteostasis, proteo proteases or serpents or staniocalcin, just to mention a few. So this was actually really interesting. And we're actually using this SASP signature now to see in a lot of cancers also, we see those signatures show up and in many other diseases that are actually age-related. But today I wanted to tell you a little bit about these extracellular vesicles. They're actually super interesting because not only do you have now individual proteins uh, being released into the extracellular um, kind of milieu, right? So you, you should think about actually um, there is a cell and it releases these things into, out, into their outside. What does that mean? I mean, in a tissue culture, you can collect it from the conditioned media, but in a tissue itself, in, in the human body, for example, these proteins actually go into the extracellular matrix uh, typically, but then when they're part of uh, exosomes, they can travel much further, right? So it's actually really interesting, you know, um, you know, extracellular vesicles get formed and then they can either connect to other cells, maybe be uptaken by other cells in the tissue, but they can also enter into the bloodstream, into the circulation, and maybe even reach other organs. So, you know, this could be a mechanism how there is inter-organ communication, which becomes more and more important. And, you know, um, I asked about multimorbidities earlier because I really think that um, actually it is also interesting to look at different uh, diseases at the same time because a lot of elderly people actually have more than one disease, but we all know that this then makes it so much more challenging as Rene earlier discussed already, right? But I mean, this is uh, though something what happens in the uh, human body that there are multi-morbidities. So looking at exosomes, they're typically around 100 nanometers, but there's actually a lot of other vesicles too. Um, there's micro vesicles, but also apoptotic bodies or lipid bodies, you know, so so this is actually quite complex. So um, what we did first again, and this is work from Sandeep Patel, who was a postdoc in my lab. And so we did a similar thing to what we had done in the SASP Atlas, where we would induce senescence in tissue culture first, and then later look at human plasma in cohorts of young individuals and older individuals, and then see if we see some of those um, kind of signatures we do see in cell culture. Um, and we have different ways of how we enrich also for these extracellular vesicles. We have actually either antibody isolation kits, or we can also do uh, centrifugation. So we actually did both, um, you know, in our studies. 
And then we do the proteomic analysis and we're actually using an approach that is um, very interesting and modern, I feel um, it's called data independent acquisition. So instead of um, kind of using isobaric labels, we're doing label free proteomics and then uh, you know using so-called spectral libraries that we compare our data back to and are able to search our data. So we can actually discover and quantify proteins at the same time in a very comprehensive way. So we kind of like this uh, approach and have been using this for, uh, you know, since um, data independent acquisition or SWOT, our first speaker also referred to it as SWOT. Um, you know, that's uh, the quantification method we're using currently in our lab. So we're building these uh, spectral libraries of exosomes and then we can do the proteomic analysis. And I will also show you some lipidomic analysis that we have done in parallel. And, um, you know, what was really interesting, uh, we had like these senescence stimuli, uh, either irradiation, doxorubicin treatment or antimycin treatment, and those would cause either DNA damage or uh, mitochondrial damage. And then uh, the cells and tissue culture would become senescent, and then they would release the exosomes and they could either, you know, kind of interact with other cells. Uh, but what I mentioned earlier, one thing that's actually quite detrimental for the tissue is that all of this release of either soluble proteins or microvesicles goes into the extracellular matrix and can highly damage um, the extracellular matrix. And the extracellular matrix, you have to think about, it's almost like a scaffold. And you know how, uh, and, it, and, and if the scaffold that's holding cells gets damaged, this can influence a lot other cells that are either nearby or even further away. So what did we see? We saw a lot of damage to what we actually call the matrizone of the extracellular matrix. These are, you know, the ratios that I'm showing here of a specific inducer over the controls where uh, no senescence was induced. And you can see that with the different inducers, the matrizome and ECM modifiers uh, all behave in the same direction, uh, real remodeling, either the downregulation here or the upregulation uh, shown here. So that was actually really interesting. And this is a little bit how we depict this, uh, the damage in the ECM. But we saw actually a lot of other changes also. For example, um, we saw a lot of loss in antioxidants with the different senescent inducers, and then also kind of upregulation of a lot of inflammatory proteins. So that was actually quite interesting. So, you know, this kind of uh, shows a little bit how we think about this, right? Like ECM changes, <clears throat> inflammation, antioxidants go down, and then there's a lot of secondary senescence inducers, which is actually kind of um, not, not good for neighboring cells of senescent cells. Often you see in tissues like these hotspots of, you know, like senescent cells that are kind of clustered together. And that is probably a result of the secondary senescence. And we're investigating this as part of our tissue mapping center, as part of senescence network, SenNet. But today um, I stay focused on these exosomes and after we had done these kind of interesting cell culture uh, experiments with the senescent cells, uh, we now are looking at real, uh, you know, cohorts of young and aging uh, people, and we found in plasma over 1,356 proteins, which was, we were quite happy about that in these extracellular vesicles. They don't have as bad a dynamic range as plasma itself, so this is uh, why we actually quite liked it. And, um, you know, these are some of the mechanisms we see here, a lot of serpents change also and, um, you know, so it was a quite uh, some interesting profile. I will show you here a few specific proteins we were particularly interested in. Also some APO, um, you know, kind of uh, proteins, APOL1 here, um, you know, that are kind of influencing the kind of lipid metabolism in a human body. And I'm showing you another volcano plot here on this next slide. And I wanted to point out again, here we even see the APOE. I wanted to point out the really good uh, statistics here, even though these are human studies, 
uh, upregulation and downregulation. And we saw a lot of um, dysfunction in lipid pathways. And I actually showed this uh, to my collaborator, um, you know, like, um, um, you know, Erin Baker one time, and she was quite intrigued by uh, some of this dysregulation in the lipid pathway. And, um, you know, that led to uh, us kind of collaborating on this together. So I'd love to tell you a little bit about that work, which was really interesting uh, and has yielded really interesting results. So, you know, we, we then thought, well, we still have a lot of this plasma. We could just send this to Erin uh, Baker and her team. And um, that's what we did. And we actually used two different ways of um, preparing the plasma. We used ultrafiltration and size exclusion, what we had actually used for the proteomics work, but then also the antibody enrichment. And uh, Erin actually analyzed this using Skyline. What is really interesting is that she has adjuvant mass spectrometers that have another level of gas phase separation called ion mobility. And you can just imagine uh, this is another different separation based uh, that is different from the chromatography that we have. Uh, ion mobility is based on separating different shapes of molecules, which is actually particularly interesting in lipids because a lot of the lipids have different head groups and different shapes. So, you know, and this is showing you like how differently shaped molecules can be separated in the uh, MS1 space, in the original space of looking at the, you know, molecular weight, and then they can be fragmented on top of that. So it just makes the kind of analyte portfolio less complex. And so you can get better um, quantification for these rather complex lipids. And I'm showing you a couple of these lipid classes here. There's many different classes, glycerides, but then they can have either two or three different chains of fatty acids, or, you know, we can have ceramides, uh, phosphatidyl, cholines here, and then they have Actually, uh, this is what I was referring to earlier, right? They can have these head groups and then different shapes of fatty acids and some may be unsaturated and some are saturated. And, you know, so it's either, it's even different whether you have the one amino acid in the one position here or in the other. So the complexity of lipid analysis is quite challenging. And um, Aaron Baker has really kind of made a very uh, confident uh, quantification methodology that she has developed in her lab. And so you can see that based on these different head maps, you can kind of cluster these lipids a little bit um, because it will be so complex else to visualize those, right? Some cluster are more close to each other versus others that are a different class of lipid type. And, um, you know, so we're doing this kind of dendrogram uh, and then kind of uh, visualizing the quantification on that. And this is what this is showing. Uh, we had the different extractions, right? I mentioned the size exclusion and then the antibody extraction. And in fact, um, what we found out is when we use size exclusion, we would also get lipid bodies, not only exosomes or extracellular vesicles, but also really lipid bodies. So that is why when we use the antibody approach that goes specifically to surface proteins on the surface of the exosomes, we actually get quite different profiles uh, between the old and the young cohort, which is actually super interesting because some classes of uh, lipids here, phosphatidylcholine, are actually, you know, uh, upregulated when we extract them here using the kind of size exclusion, and they, they don't really show up when we, or don't uh, show up as changed when we use the other extraction method. And so doing both approaches is actually quite interesting, just knowing that in the first approach, we get the lipid bodies also in addition to exosomes versus the extraction two is really specific to exosomes. And we still saw a lot of really cool changes um, with high fold change, um, you know, that we could see um, and, and, you know, the, the, so it really was true that really there was a lot of dysregulation in lipid um, profiles. So, you know, just to summarize the um, lipid profiles here, we can actually see that with irradiation, we see a lot of 
lipids go up, some go down. With doxorubicin, we also see a lot of things go up, but very specifically to this class here, the swingomyelites, they go up much more with the doxorubicin than you know, the different dots are different chain lengths. Uh, of fatty acids uh, in this class of swingomyelites. And then in the Midas, um, you know, we, we see additional um, kind of maybe kind of somewhat similar profiles compared to the doxorubicin. But this was really interesting. And, um, you know, we're also particularly interested in some of these lipids that I'm highlighting here, some of which are really kind of upregulated with the irradiation. And it remains to be shown uh, what this really means biologically. But, you know, this was a kind of a proof of principle study that we did here for these lipids. And then showing you just a few here um, that, you know, kind of in the senescence are much higher um, and, you know, you know, but also across senescence show up robustly. So, yeah, so that was really kind of fun. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit some additional work, and that really uh, connects really nicely with what Maggie had shown in her last talk. That's why I was so interested in what she showed. Um, we did some very deep transcriptomic work uh, with Dr. Luigi Ferrucci, who's working at the NIA, and uh, Rudy Campisi and I, together with Francesco Neri, we generated endothelial cells that were either normal or we had a senescence induced and we had the senescent endothelial cells. Endothelial cells are particularly important in the body because they line the blood vessels. So a lot of proteins or other, you know, analytes get released from endothelial cells into the circulation. So that's why we were particularly interested in those. So then uh, Luigi's group with Lisa Hartnell and, um, you know, also Nirat uh, and Dimitri, um, they analyzed all this data uh, that we provided to them for senescent cells with either Illumina, not either, but all of these methods, Illumina, Nanopore, and PacBio. And, um, you know, I think I'm showing you this on this slide here. So we used um, you know, all uh, these different platforms to do really very deep sequencing. And, uh, you know, in some of these methodologies, you get actually particularly long reads uh, here in the PacBio and Nanopore. So this, they were actually particularly interested in these uh, kind of sequencing efforts here. And then, of course, similar to what our previous speaker spoke uh, and presented, um, we then analyze these samples also on the proteomic level. This is just showing, for example, at this moment, uh, kind of expression change differences, um, and you show some, and it shows some really very classical proteins here. Uh, the MMPs, those are metalloproteinases and IGF binding proteins or serpents. I mean, in our SAS butlers, we always see the robust induction of serpents. Um, and we see this here in this very large endothelial study, but also this papalysin uh, protein that's circled here, that's a protein that is particularly important and increases with IGF signaling. And, um, you know, we have shown in some literature studies, not we, but we have uh, found these studies where, um, you know, knockout mice of papalysin actually show increased survival. So these data sets are huge and we're currently in the process of really uh, kind of doing the proteomic follow-up of these samples. Um, these are some kind of um, signatures that we got in this data set. Um, and what is really interesting, even in the senescence, uh, in the senescence signatures, we even see already on the expression level, we see large regulation with RNA splicing, uh, splicing machineries, and of course, you know, DNA replication and DNA packaging, but it already indicates that there is the spliceosome that's really changed with aging and senescence. And that's actually what we see when we look at the differentially spliced transcripts, and we hope we can confirm those on the uh, proteome level. Those samples are actually acquiring right now on our instrumentation in the proteomics lab. And yeah, so this is actually really interesting that we see it already on the uh, expression level here. And, um, you know, what we really uh, are looking at in these particular uh, cohorts 
um, is so interesting. Um, you, we're looking at the SASP of different cohorts. Uh, Nate and I had started to do this in the BLSA, and now we actually still collaborate, have kind of extended these uh, signatures into a different study that's called in Chianti, which is actually a higher number of individuals, like almost a thousand people with a very large mass range, uh, not mass range, with a very large uh, age range. And, um, you know, kind of uh, looking at the, how do our core SAS proteins change in these, both of these studies actually now. So, um, you know, when we look at the age uh, associations of our SAS factors, you can see that, um, you know, these are the common players that showed an age association, SAS factors that had uh, relevance in aging and had an aging signature. And you can see a lot of really interesting proteins again, right? We like this posterior, um, posterior um, I forgot the name now, um, but, you know, but then also these metalloproteinases, TGF beta pathways, MMP1s, serpents again. But if we kind of zoom out a little bit, you see how hugely regulated uh, the GDF15 is and what a huge uh, age association it has. And we already saw this at the time um, in the BLSA, but now also, now also see it in the Inkianti Healthy Aging Study. Particular proteins I wanted to also point out are this uh, cystatin and IGF uh, binding protein 2. And I wanted to show you, um, we were now interested in, do these SAS factors that are uh, related to aging, do they actually have um, I mean, some kind of uh, connection with metrics, uh, with clinical metrics that were measured for all of these people in these cohorts, right? Looking, for example, how do some of these fast, uh, SAS factors actually correlate not just with aging, but also, for example, with kidney function, with inflammation, with blood pressure, with grip strength? waist circumference or gait speed. It is actually incredibly interesting that gait speed is one of the best biomarkers, uh, you know, where uh, the slower the gait speed, um, the more fast people are aging or the more multimorbidities they may have or the more biologically aged they are. So do some of our fast factors actually relate to the aging, um, to, to these clinical metrics? And so here it shows you that, um, you know, these are um, showing the different metrics that we measured and then how many SAS factors actually correlated with them. And so that was actually super interesting for us and uh, kind of highlighting a few of these proteins, see these top three or four here, they actually correlate with nine or seven or five of these clinical metrics. Um, and that was really interesting. And I think we, um, I highlight a few proteins here that I have throughout my talk mentioned. And um, particularly, I wanted to point out again, the GDF15 and cystatin. And if I show you this, right? Like, so it actually shows that uh, a lot of these kind of um, clinical metrics were actually upregulated in people who also had upregulation of GDF 15. So, you know, and so these ones here, when uh, the red ones here, they are actually not healthy when they're upregulated, or in this case, they're not healthy when there's downregulation, right? If the gate speed goes down, that's not healthy. If the grip strength goes down, that's not healthy. So it's interesting how SAS signatures of GDF 15 or here Cystatin 3, how they correlate not only with aging and uh, but also with clinical metrics that we can uh, measure in the clinic easily with lab tests that are commonly done with elderly population. I think I want to spend like uh, two more minutes on maybe, you know, a little bit in uh, association of a disease with um, both aging as well as cellular senescence. We're actually particularly interested in osteoarthritis. This is supposed to show you a uh, knee and, um, you know, you can see that uh, this is supposed to show you a healthy knee with like a nice cartilage and a very healthy bone and the bones, they have bone cells, osteocytes, osteoclasts. But if the person ages and when the person ages, we think that senescence burden increases and you can see how this may then um, kind of really damage the cells in the 
kind of bone, but also, of course, very strongly the cartilage. We have developed a kind of 3D model of building little, you know, we call it knee in a dish, where you not only grow chondrocytes, which are the cells in in a cartilage, you were not only growing them 2D, but now in a 3D structure and scaffold according to a protocol developed by Jennifer Ellis. And then, so we're growing these 3D pellets and 3D engineered um, tissues, and then kind of measure those with mass spectrometry, which we think is much more uh, close to what happens in a living body. And when this is how these pellets look, they actually want to cluster together, right? Like these are, you know, cells that are in this 3D tissue. And, um, you know, we then are able to make those senescence much more kind of simulating what happens in a human tissue. And when we do this, uh, the senescence versus non-senescence in these chondrocyte pellets, they cluster very differently and are very um, different. And I want to point out, these are primary human uh, chondrocytes uh, obtained from human um, kind of tissue. So these are, I mean, primary, that's very important, and in tissues. And uh, when we do this senescence versus non-senescence, this has allowed us to develop new targets for you know, therapeutic interventions, particularly this CREOP is very interesting. And there are specific senolytics that particularly target this uh, protein here. All right, uh, this is the particular uh, senolytic that I mentioned here. So that's very interesting. I hope that I have been able to tell you a little bit about how we think about aging, how we think aging and senescence goes together. We really put a lot of emphasis on ECM and how the extracellular matrix also becomes more stiff with aging and how this then can also really closely relate to cancer. And this is actually one of the things I am researching how these different things all correlate to each other and inform each other. And uh, having developed the Plus at the time, I'm pointing out here, right, the relevance of splice variants, ECM changes, and of course, we're interested in PTMs. And with this, I'd like love to thank you again for this opportunity to speak. And thanks so much to my lab and my collaborators. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Birgit. Um, do we have questions uh, from the chat or? Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to jump on the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, so uh, I, I I have some short questions. Mm -hmm. um, I actually let me see. So um, I was wondering, um, uh, are the um, the SASP, the senescence associated uh, secretory phenotypes, um, um, extracellular fascicle? Um, are, are they known to 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 recruit immune cells? Um, so that that's my first short question, and and I have another another one. Um, so okay. and um, also if I, I was wondering if it's known whether the um uh, fascicles um so after their secretion, are, are they would would they be going into an other cell types and and being taken up by some other cell types so 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 some like aging signals are sent to like all the other cells oh yeah that those are both great questions i mm -hmm. i will thank you for that the first question yeah there is quite a link between inflammation and senescence uh you know it's actually really interesting and we are also now working with eric verden where we're even looking at senescence signatures of uh, inflammation related cells right like b cells uh, t cells so yeah i think there is a very close connection um we also we have looked at senescence of macrophages um so yeah i think that is actually one of hot spot area in the aging area cur currently um you know but we ourselves are just starting with that and i don't know for sure if they recruit uh, the infl inflammatory cells. So that I don't know for sure, but a very hot topic to research. Your other question, um, the vesicles, um, oh, sorry, no, I forgot a little bit what the second question was. Oh, the 
Oh, if they if they get uptaken by other cells, yes. So yeah, that is actually the release and uptake is actually happening all the time. It's just that when the cells become senescent, there is just so much more that gets released. And uh, so yeah, I mean the, the these this is a way how one cell can communicate with the other. And we're actually currently doing some experiments in uh, in the context of the brain where we're looking at, for example, senescent and astrocytes and then what do they release and when we co-culture them with normal neurons how does that affect the normal neurons because we know that nearby cells will take up um, the exosomes or other cells so yeah i think this is a really super interesting because it goes to cell cell communication but also this inter-organ communication so yeah thank you mm -hmm. thank you yeah next question uh, i unmuted you from dr christoph turk Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, uh, Birgit. Chris Turk here from the Max Planck in Munich. Uh, nice talk. I'm, I'm particularly interested in the exocellular vesicles um, mm -hmm. work that you've done. I have two questions. Uh, when I looked at the volcano plot of the mm -hmm. uh, plasma EVs, it, it looks as though, I mean, you have proteins in there that are also soluble in, in blood, obviously, albumin and others that came up. So, so how do we distinguish what's coming uh, from the EVs versus what's actually, you know, soluble in the blood and possibly might be even sticking to the EVs? Yes. And then you pick it up in your proteomics analyses. Oh, I think you're absolutely right, right? I mean, we are trying to isolate the exosomes as cleanly as we can, but I mean, I think as as best as one tries, there will always be some sticking uh, to the exosomes. So I think that's a bit a hard question to how do we differentiate? I mean, in a way, I guess one way could, I mean, hopefully doing a lot of replicates in order to then uh, you know, kind of maybe take out some or filter out some random, more random, non-specific sticking to the outside of the um, extracellular vesicles. But yeah, I mean, I think those are limitations of the procedures. We have found that when we do the antibody enrichment, um, um, you know, with antibody against um, surface proteins of the EVs, that there you can actually do much harsher washes of the, you know, and so now they even have developed some magnetic beads. We did actually, Nate and I did some very initial work with a group in South Africa uh, where they had magnetic beads that they loaded with those antibodies that we had recommended to them. And this was now published either in BioArchive or in, in a peer reviewed journal uh, by Mike McCoss and the South Africa team. So yeah, but then when you do the uh, antibody uh, based one, um, sometimes one gets a little bit less proteins but that has been quite optimized but yeah those are pitfalls of these technologies so um you know we do as best as we can <laughs> yeah just a follow-up which uh which antibodies i mean it would you know what what proteins are you using for the antibodies uh, what specific antibodies yeah. oh yeah those are like three they're like cd what is it 60 seven or now i almost forgot let me oh, just... i see some of the cd uh, yeah some of yeah some of these that are quite uh common across most evs um mm -hmm. and um those were like three different ones um okay. sorry i should know them by heart but uh oh, I, that's I, okay. yeah that's Thank you. <laughs> yes you're welcome <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. Any... Uh, more questions? Oh, Renee has a question. <laughs> Hi, Birgit. This is always an um, excellent <laughs> body of work altogether. Oh, um, so I'm always um, surprised every time I see like different studies of aging and Alzheimer's and other age-related diseases and just how much overlap there are in a lot of like the key signals and proteins that are changing. So mm -hmm. I noticed like you had APOE was one of the things that changed in your um, healthy young aging studies. And so have you ever thought broadly about like how we, you know, we as a field might start to look at the the overlap of like these different proteins that send one as they mm -hmm. reach a certain age down a path of a particular age related disease. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, curious about your thoughts in that regard. Oh, yeah, I think you go to the heart of my thinking, <laughs> because 
I mean, I really think it's so surprising, right? We as proteomics researchers have the opportunity to have look at so many different models, right? You mentioned some of yours earlier, and we do the same where we have many different systems, either cancer, kidney disease, osteoarthritis, um, you know, your what you mentioned, the AD, but also Huntington's disease, other neurological disorders. And yes, they have these amazing uh, common signatures. I really think that this is because of, I think there's underlying cellular senescence as mechanism of aging that does really contribute to that. And then another, which is very closely related, changes in ECM with aging, because ECM determines fate. Uh, as we age, the ECM gets damaged and then uh, cells uh, get these kind of signals and, and change and one can actually renew ECM, you know, like uh, rejuvenate the ECM, which then actually changes again the fate of the cells and can make them better or look younger when the ECM is younger. So I think we as a field, and Renee, we, you and I, we should connect on that. Um, we that's, This is a, it's a message that I really think we have and uh, where aging research becomes so important as part of, in general, disease uh, research, I feel. They cannot be separated, I feel. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. I'll follow up with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, Ed, uh, Lau, if you want to ask your question or I read it, <laughs> I will can, yeah, we can unmute you. Uh, just a second, I can, okay. Oh, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, so, yeah. uh, my question in the chat, were you able to identify any vesicular membrane proteins like tetraspan and CC963 in the proteomics experiments? Do those proteins tell you anything about the potential destination, like which cell type do those vesicles you know, go to? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we haven't really looked as deeply into that, although um, Sandeep, my postdoc, um, you know, he had like um, done some pathway analysis where he found specific membrane proteins, but um, we haven't really followed up too much on that. But you get at a really great point where our dream is really to be able to know where what are the targets of these extracellular vesicles, right? Which other cell types to specific subgroups of vesicles maybe go uh, versus or maybe even which are destined to go to other organs. We're actually doing a really cool project now with a very uh, established scientist at um, UCSF where they have done some really interesting kind of models where they actually, um, you know, um, they uh, have a Cree model where they can kind of, um, you know, kind of target specific organs and then trigger those specific organs to release signals then and then how does that result into uh, circulation changes or um, you know um, kind of conditioned media changes when you do it in tissue uh, um, you know cell culture so yeah I mean one has to find a little bit and more um, you know kind of uh, uh, experimental design to really ask those questions and yeah that's a but that I think that is the this is this is um, knowing what you ask would be super cool but I don't quite know it yet <laughs> that's amazing looking forward to following that work thank you <laughs> thank you okay I think that's all the questions so thank you Birgit this was extremely interesting thank um, you <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to point out how much I always enjoy working with Dr. Basisti. <laughs> <laughs> yes, same here. And clearly we've collaborated in the past before, and you'll see that in my talk as well. <laughs> and, and so this is a nice segue to introduce Dr. next speaker, Dr. Nathan Basisti, who used to work with uh, Birgit as a postdoc, and now he's an investigator at the National Institute of Aging, heading the Translational Geroproteomics Unit. Uh, and uh, he will talk about his uh, current research to us. Okay, thank you so much, Alexandra. And um, thank you to all the speakers for this really phenomenal uh, set of presentations. And I think, you know, it's really great that Hupo is now uh, organizing a webinar on aging. And it's also very timely because um, I think as everyone has shown that this is, you know, aging research is really, um, really, um, you know, becoming mainstream and becoming very important. And in fact, it's reaching a point where a lot of 
you know, not only in academia, but industry has taken an interest and we now have even aging trials that are beginning to happen. And so I think it's really important now to um, acknowledge that I think proteomics has a lot to contribute, not only to the basic understanding of aging, but now to help with translating, uh, doing translational geroscience, which is a little bit of uh, what I'll talk about today in geroscience uh, being the study of the biology of aging. And, you know, uh, you know, I hope by the end of this talk, you understand not only the value of proteomics in aging, but also that it's worthwhile to spend our, you know, efforts, talented people in this field to focus on aging, right? Because this is a very important, um, very important um, uh, topic to study and very important to public health. And one reason for that is that aging is uh, the greatest risk, risk factor, excuse me, for most chronic diseases, right? Including the big killers like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease. So um, as, our, as we age, our susceptibility to and our incidence of all these things uh, increases. And even though we're probably, you know, dying of aging means often dying of a heart attack or something. And even if you die of a heart attack, you're going to die with multiple things, right? So there's this problem of multimorbidity, uh, accumulation of deficits and diseases as we age, and our quality of life is severely diminished. Right. Um, but, you know, we in the geroscience field don't believe that, you know, uh, it's a coincidence that over over time or with age, uh, we have uh, increasing diseases. We think that there's something about the aging process that creates an environment that's permissive to these diseases. And these basic aging processes are increasing our incidence of susceptibility to, to diseases. And in fact, we've identified some of these, and these include things like cellular senescence, which you've heard a ton about today from Birgit, and you will continue to hear about from me, and also loss of prote proteostasis, and there are others as well, um, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, DNA damage, et cetera. These have been identified as um, underlying drivers of the aging process. And the, the uh, you know, the beautiful thing about this geroscience hypothesis is that, you know, if, if true, that means that we can target these uh, aging processes uh, to mitigate multiple age-related diseases simultaneously, right? And then from a public health perspective, this is great because it'll reduce disease burden and keep us healthy into, old, into uh, older age. But also from an economic perspective, this is really great because now you have um, a strategy where you target a specific uh, you know, a underlying age-related disease to address multiple diseases, rather than at the very end of your life, trying to cure all of these very complex diseases, which is where all of our healthcare spending goes. So I think this is a really important field and, um, uh, you know, to focus on going forward for public health. And fortunately for us, um, at least in mice, we've shown that this paradigm seems to be true. So there are aging interventions in mice that we can target. Um, or aging processes we can target with different interventions that extend lifespan and health span. And these include things like dietary restriction, uh, pharmacologically with rapamycin or senolytics. And these are what Birgit mentioned that target senescent cells among other things. And these all have the desired effect of uh, increasing health span, right? And keeping the mice healthy into an older age. And so uh, this is uh, one of the, basically the mission of uh, my lab at the NIA. So we're the geroproteomics unit. So we're kind of a, you know, this is a mashup of geroscience and proteomics. And I think that, you know, proteomics uh, can offer some very valuable things to the geroscience field and, in, and particularly for translation. With proteomics, we can identify therapeutic targets and also we can identify protein biomarkers, right, that'll help us um, uh, discover and monitor uh, diseases. And the, va the vast majority of uh, the work in my lab goes into studying cellular senescence in various ways with different proteomic approaches. So for example, you know, with proteomics, we can identify things that are secreted or on the surface of these senescent cells, but also there's some approaches we can use to identify potential drugs um, uh, that will target and um, kill these cells, which as, as I'll show them, I'll, I'll introduce uh, a little bit more cellular senescence in, in the next slide. And, uh, the other nice thing about the um, National Institute on Aging, though, is that, you know, these things that we can, we discover uh, in these culture models with proteomics, we can kind of go into these, uh, these flagship studies at the National Institute on Aging. We have these really big studies like the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging. This is the longest running study of aging. Um, 
uh, in the U.S. And uh, of course, and, and Birgit has also worked together with the BLSAs, as she had shown. And also we have the uh, study of longitudinal aging in mice, or SLAM, so it's your equivalent, really big, robust longitudinal study of aging in mice. So we can look in, at these things we discover and test them in vivo and, and validate them in these cohorts as well. And a second uh, part of, uh, you know, focus of, of the lab is also uh, for method development, but in, in particularly one of the understudied areas of proteomics, I think, is protein turnover, right? So a lot of people focus on changes in abundance, but if we use tools like metabolic labeling in combination with mass spec, we could also measure and estimate in vivo protein turnover rates. And as it turns out, these are really um, important. You know, protein homeostasis is really important to, during aging. And so one of the focuses, other focuses in my lab is to develop these methods, uh, particularly computational methods to now uh, take and make these kind of approaches easier for, um, for researchers studying, you know, particular age or disease to, uh, to apply. So today I would like to share with you, you know, one, um, particular application of proteomics, uh, and that is in the in um, translation and development of, of biomarkers for cellular senescence. So just a quick background, I think Birgit did a wonderful job of introducing senescent cells. So these are a, a uh, hallmark of aging, right? Um, so if you imagine a healthy cell, um, it can encounter a very severe stress that's not quite enough to kill it, but that's enough to basically permanently traumatize it, right? It never goes back, it never becomes the same again. So it um, this permanently traumatized state is called senescence. So the cell will stop dividing forever. It's never gonna divide again. And then it secretes this SAS, this secretory phenotype of senescent cells. And with age, these cells are accumulating in all of our tissues. And then they, through the SAS, are, are driving multiple age-related diseases. And as Birgit explained that there are different stresses that can, um, that our cells experience intrinsic and extrinsic throughout their lives that can make them senescent. Uh, uh, many of these are genotoxic in nature, so DNA damaging agents, but also, um, you know, uh, Birgit had showed mitochondrial stresses, right, or oncogene stresses, or even certain drugs that people take in clinics, like um, for cancer or HIV, uh, the chemotherapies and HIV drugs can drive cells into senescence. And so, Understanding their biology is very important, not only for aging, but also for these patient populations, which may um, be suffering side effects from these drugs because of cellular senescence. And so we know now at this point very exhaustively that um, if you selectively kill senescent cells in mice, that uh, you know they, they stay healthier later into life, they live longer, and you mitigate many age-related diseases. So this is a super promising now approach for us to uh, applying to humans, right? Uh, but to do this in humans, we need a few things. First, we're going to need the drugs that um, kill senescent cells or alter their phenotypes. So these are called senolytics or senomorphics, respectively. And then very importantly, we're going to need biomarkers, right, that tell us, you know, uh, somebody's senescent cell burden uh, so that we know to treat them with the senolytic. And then we want to know how different um, senescence-associated proteins, which clinical uh, phenotypes, are they actually um, helping us predict? And then if you treat a person with uh, a senolytic, um, you want to be able to see that biomarker go down to tell you if the drug is working, right? And so this uh, <laughs> this slide may look a little familiar. So you, as you can tell, Birgit and I have worked together in the past. Uh, we follow this kind of general uh, biomarker discovery pipeline paradigm where we ask you know, what are the proteins associated with senescence? Can we then uh, detect those in, in plasma, right? And then we go into a cohort and say, but are they also elevated in populations where you expect to see more senescence, such as an aged population or uh, age-related uh, disease cohort, right? And so we've applied this, and this is work, uh, a lot of work now in the last few years, now published with Birgit, uh, we've applied this in uh, earlier studies where we've now identified a set of, um, uh, of the SAS, we call the core SAS that we can see in blood uh, in aged individuals, right? It goes up with aging. We've published this um, resource called SAS Atlas for other people who are interested in identifying, you know, senescence markers in their studies. They could hopefully refer to this and it'll be an aid to them. And we know that a subset of these core SAS proteins 
are, are predictive of clinical outcomes like mortality and multimorbidity. And this is this Italian aging study that Birgit had mentioned earlier. So they're, they're also useful for, for clinical prediction. So a lot of the stuff that we've done in the past now has been focused on certain cell types like fibroblasts and you know, epithelial cells that have developed our signatures. And so now since starting my lab here at the NIA, we've been thinking about, you know, what are some other cell types that might be particularly biologically relevant and important when it comes to senescence? And one of the cell types we landed on are immune cell types and in particular monocytes. So we know again that senescence in immune cells or any cell for that matter will drive aging and inflammation, but uh, immune cells in particular, it's uh, uh, kind of emerged in the last uh, few years that senescence in the immune cells can propagate senescence in our solid organs and in other in other cells through our body, which then in turn also drive aging. So you know, immune cells seem like a very um, a very uh, relevant and potentially important upstream kind of target if you if you're going to target senescence systemically. So for that reason and several others, uh, we focus now decided to focus on senescence in monocytes. Uh, another reason is that, you know, monocytes are abundant in circulation and they're proximal to the blood, right? So they have very good biomarker potential. They're also easily sorted uh, for the same reason. And there's at least some evidence that these are increasing with age uh, in humans, right? So what we did is we've uh, kind of embarked on the same biomarker discovery pipeline, uh, but focused on senescence and monocytes. And what I'm showing you here is work now driven by Rima Banerjee, who's a, a talented postdoc in the lab, and also um, Anjana Ram and Dimitris Tsitsipatis, who are other fellows at the NIA. And what they did is they uh, developed an optimized um, a culture model of cellular senescence. So they took these you know, monocyte cell lines and they uh, exposed them to different durations and doses of of DNA damage and optimize the levels of uh, cellular senescence they induce. Once they, uh, once we've had this uh, optimal senescence model, then they they took uh, senescent and healthy cells, right, and did uh, DIA uh, data independent acquisition mass spec proteomics to identify a signature of uh, senescence associated monocyte proteins. And here they were able to find. Uh, about 360 proteins uh, that were significantly increased in senescent monocytes. And just one thing I wanted to point out here, which is really interesting to us, is that some of the largest and most significant changes are in the interferon pathway. So we think one of the important aspects of the biology of these cells is that they have this, uh, you know, chronically elevated interferon response, right? And this also may be an important part of their biomarker signature. But now uh, from these studies, uh, we know which proteins are associated with senescence um, in uh, monocytes, right? So next we can turn to the clinical cohorts. And unfortunately, in the NIA, we have uh, uh, um, several uh, really cool studies uh, that we can turn to when we want to now look in vivo. One of these I mentioned earlier is the BLSA or the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging. And here um, we're fortunate to have a large proteomic data set from about 1,100 individuals uh, using the SOMASCAN 7K platform. Uh, but we also have another uh, smaller yet um, a cohort called Gestalt. This is a smaller but very, uh, you know, the deeply phenotyped cohort, right? So this is about 100 individuals. But here in this cohort, one of the samples they collect is a circulating monocytes, right? And these are analyzed by mass spec. And so now what we have are two aging data sets, one with soluble senescence, it was soluble um, uh, circulating proteins and one with the circulating monocytes, right? And we can now take our um, senescence associated monocyte proteins. We can take these uh, clinical um, aging associated proteins and we can then use this info to now extract our senescent monocyte protein signatures from our human cohorts. Uh, we run elastic net modeling uh, to then identify subsets of these that are um, related to different clinical outcomes related to aging that we're really interested in. So for example, changes in body composition, you know, overall mobility, mobility frailty, um, and uh, obesity, right? And with, the, with this uh, analysis, we can identify circulating uh, senescence biomarker signatures. So I want to start by sharing some data that, that we've collected looking at the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. So again, this is um, uh, the longest running study of aging in the, in the country. It's been starting, it started in 1958 and continues to 
you know, recruit people till now, uh, now, and it's so it's a really nice resource. And we collaborated here with Keenan Walker, who is uh, spearheaded this SOMA scan proteomic analysis on 1,100 individuals from the BLSA. They range in age from 22 to 96 years old, and about 52% of them are female. And I also would like to acknowledge, um, you know. Uh, a few others who were key to this collaboration, who, who are, um, you know, Dr. Luigi Ferrucci and Dr. Eleanor Simonsick, who are the co-directors of the BLSA. So without them, you know, this would not be possible. And so what we were able to do now is we were able to find that about 64 proteins from the BLSA uh, were, uh, we were able to extract our part of our senescent monocyte protein signature. I'm highlighting just a few, a subset of these in red on the right. Um, but one thing I did wanted to point out of, about these is that among this 64, we do see the interferon response proteins. And something I'll, I also find interesting is that we find, you know, these very well-known um, intracellular uh, monocyte uh, um, marker proteins, right? So CD68, for example, is a well-known marker for monocytes, and it's intracellular on the lysosomal membrane. And even in circulating uh, plasma, we seem to be able to pick up, you know, large changes in this. So it's, it's interesting that we can also see these signatures in circulating plasma. And so uh, now that we had our 64 protein panel, we wanted uh, to do, see whether these are predictive of clinical traits. So this was an analysis that was spearheaded by Brad Olinger. He's a a uh, very talented computational uh, graduate student in the lab. And so he ran elastic net modeling on the 64 protein panel on a range of different clinical uh, phenotypes that we're very interested in. And what he found is that with, uh, you know, knowing the amount of, um, uh, knowing the abundance of senescence, uh, senescent monocyte proteins in circulation can tell you a surprising, some surprising things. So for example, uh, Senescent monocyte protein um, burden in, in the in the plasma tells you something about waist size. So it we're, had a surprisingly strong correlation with waist size and related kind of body composition and metabolic metrics such as um, you know waist size. We have BMI, uh, HDL, LDL, and fasting glucose. So it tells us about body composition and metabolism. But also interesting. Um, you know, we have a number of these mobility um, metrics or grip strength. So these are kind of um, things that are really good indicators of a person's overall health in, in these clinical um, in these clinical um, uh, cohorts, right? So when you a person's gait speed or their uh, chair stance pace or their grip strength are really good overall physical health indicators. They're really well known biomarkers of aging. And what's interesting is just knowing the you know, the burden of senescence from the blood uh, in monocytes is a pretty good indicator of, uh, of these things, which are indicative of overall physical health. And then we also see some correlations with um, inflammatory markers, which we expect uh, in the context of senescence. And uh, what Brad did is now he took a subset of these and uh, plotted, a Z, like uh, he converted them into Z-scores, so they're kind of on the same scale and then plotted the linear models. So you can kind of get an idea of, you know, what are the relative correlations of these different traits. And so one thing I wanted to highlight here is that you can see that, you know, all of these lines with the positive slope. So these are things where if you have a higher senescent monocyte burden, you have uh, more of this negative thing. So your more senescence and monocytes means higher waist size, more inflammation and more fasting glucose. Whereas, uh, you know, uh, for positive, metrics like physical health, you see a negative correlation. So more senescent monocytes means lower physical health score, lower grip strength, and lower gait speed. So these predictions were all really um, interesting and promising to us. And uh, so what we wanted to do is uh, take the next step and ask whether, um, you know, some of the, if we can actually predict uh, any clinical outcomes with these. So what Brad did is he now took the data, the BLSA data, and he did an 80-20 split where he took uh, 80% of the data to train the model and then 20% to predict, right? Or did a prediction on the remaining 20%. And what he found when he did this is that our um, validation was, you know, our this validation was completely um, predictive uh, uh, as it was in the original data set. So for example, here's uh, a surprisingly high correlation with waist size, right? So we were really surprised to see that, um, you know, with uh, just knowing that, 
senescent monocyte burden in the plasma can really uh, uh, predict waist size pretty nicely. And so we thought this might actually have something to do with obesity. So um, Brad had a, a nice idea. He then uh, moved on uh, to looking at you know, uh, obesity as determined by BMI. So he took, he used the same 80% trained uh, data set and 20% test cohort, but he, he, he took the individuals and he split them into people who are uh, BMI above 25, who are people, and those people are either overweight or obese, right? And anyone under 25 is a healthy weight. And what's interesting is that he showed that, um, you know, with age and sex alone, you can kind of predict, and that's this red line here, you can kind of predict, uh, you know, obesity to some extent, but independent of age, if you now know the senescence uh, burden from these um, elast elastic net model uh, signatures, uh, that really improves uh, your ability to predict whether somebody's obese, right? So we thought this was really interesting because this was an effect also um, uh, independent of aging. And so what we thought here, perhaps what's happening here is that we're uh, picking up a obesity associated senescence signature, right? So, uh, so we, we found these results in BLSA very promising, but I also wanted to show you some uh, interesting data um, from another cohort, uh, which is not focused on the soluble plasma, but is all, uh, actually looking at the circulating monocytes themselves during aging, and that's in this Gestalt cohort. And this is a much uh, smaller study. Uh, so we were, uh, we were actually not sure what we were gonna see when we did this. So this is about 94 individuals ranging in age from 22 to 89, uh, and about 45% of them were female. And in this data set, we I detect about 11 of our senescent monocyte proteins, uh, which are shown here. And so what we did is now Brad took and ran the same elastic net modeling and the same 80-20 split. So he from the, from the beginning, he trained the, uh, the model on 80% of the data and then uh, did the prediction on 20%. And what we were really surprised to see is that even in a much lower powered cohort, uh, we get a really nice validation. So uh, looking into circulating monocytes themselves uh, and looking at our ability to predict waste size, we see a, a correlation that's uh, just as good as what we saw in the BLSA cohort with a much smaller sample size. And in fact, we can see uh, you know, a number of things are now still significantly uh, predicted looking at these senescent signatures and monocytes. So we're very excited about this. And, um, and we find it really interesting that, you know, senescence burden can actually tell us something, not only about uh, these certain age-related traits and clinical metrics and, and metabolic health overall, but even independent of aging, right? Um, we could predict uh, obesity and related metrics. And so, our hypothesis is that this is uh, something to do with obesity-associated senescence. So a senescence can be you know, related not only to uh, aging, but also to obesity. And I think this also highlights uh, the importance of you know, perhaps focusing uh, when we do senescence trials to not only focus on aged individuals, but also it'll be important to focus on these obese populations as well as potential um, populations who could benefit from drugs that target senescence. <clears throat> Um, and I would like to just spend uh, a, a minute or so just to switch gears here, because I, I wanted to show you that's one way that we can use uh, leverage proteomics to do translational geroscience. But I do want to point out there are other really uh, important approaches uh, that'll help us understand aging biology. And one of those I wanted to point out is protein turnover. And so over the last decade, we've seen uh, from a number of studies that uh, uh, that we've measured protein turnover is that it has a really important uh, um, relationship to aging. So uh, we've been a part, uh, a part of a number of studies that look at aging in different mice, mouse models uh, of longevity, right? And so what I'm showing you here are we had, uh, we've looked at mice that are calorie restricted or better apomycin or transgenic mice that are longer lived because they have more antioxidants in their mitochondria. And that in every case where we see longevity in mice, we also see that the overall, uh, the half-life of the proteome is increased. And this is something we see in multiple tissues. So there seems to be a really strong relationship between half-life and longevity. And this is something seen not only in our labs, but by other groups. So, um, uh, you know, the Hellerstein lab at Berkeley had seen the same thing with rapamycin and in the Snell dwarf mice. And even if you compare across 
different species with a different uh, longevity, right, with a different natural lifespan. So, for example, if you look at the long-lived naked mole rat, which lives 10 times longer than the mouse, which is the same size, right, you see also that they have even longer, longer half-lives compared to mice. So this is true across different species as well. And in fact, Sinagamagami's lab has showed this across a range of mammalian species, uh, right, ranging from the mouse to the bowhead whale, which is the longest lived. And he showed this beautiful correlation between maximum lifespan and protein turnover rates. So clearly there's a really important fundamental role and relationship for uh, proteostasis and protein turnover. And it seems to be, you know, kind of a requirement for longer life. So I think, you know, there are other really cool things here that we can do with proteomics. And this is one of the relationships that I hope people can investigate further going forward. Uh, and we've been really interested in this and to perform studies that examine this further. And one of the things we've done now is, uh, this is also uh, together with Birgit and the, uh, the, the Skyline Core Development Team at the University of Washington has developed computational tools. So for example, here we've developed the external tool for, the, for Skyline and we hope that this will enable people who are doing metabolic labeling studies to more accurately and easily um, you know, measure protein turnover rates in vivo in uh, their model of interest. Um, and so I just like to end on this note that you know, there are, uh, I think, a lot of ways for us to leverage proteomics. And I hope that I've shown you a few of the ways we can leverage proteomics to uh, help us understand aging, but there's a lot of work to do. And so some of the opportunities that I see in this field going forward, for example, are uh, development and you application of technologies that help improve our proteome coverage and, and body fluid. So there are a number of technologies, both mass spec and non-mass spec based technologies that can help us improve our proteome coverage. And I think it'd be nice to now include these kind of um, uh, applications in aging trials and cohorts that are now ongoing, right? Uh, and also going forward, I think it'll be important to conduct well-designed uh, and longitudinal studies. So we've even seen from previous speakers that, uh, you know, sometimes the baseline that you start with is different from be between individuals. And there are things like cohort effects and, and other things when you do cross-sectional studies. So longitudinal studies going forward may help us um, you know, overcome some of this heterogeneity we see between people, particularly in aging. And then finally, and this has come up today as well, is that it would be nice to look, uh, have, uh, look at things with proteoform resolution, right? So if we can look at uh, uh, biomarkers or biology with proteoform resolution or look at PTMs, right, that may help us um, going forward to, to, um, to develop more sensitive and specific biomarkers and you know, a lot of our current, well, none of our really current discovery proteomic technologies uh, have proteoform re resolution. They aren't really paying attention to which proteoform they measure. So this would be you know, something really important, I think, to implement uh, uh, in, in future studies in aging. And with that, I'd like to thank, um, thank uh, you all for uh, attending this session and Hupo for, for hosting this session. And of course, I'd like to thank my lab, particularly Rima uh, and Brad for the for the data I showed you today, and our collaborators in uh, clinical collaborators in the BLSA and the Gestalt cohorts. And I am looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nate. And uh, we have uh, first question in the chat already. What post treatment analysis was involved in the optimization of the monocyte senescent model? What what post treatment? Uh, very good question. So it's very important when you um, to optimize these studies, these uh, models very well, because you know there is a lot of uh, I think um, a lot of confusion in, in different groups about what exactly defines a senescent cell. And so what we do is we basically um, with each different treatment and duration, we measure a whole panel of senescence markers that we find will hopefully cover enough of our bases that we can call these senescent. One of the things that we measure for is, uh, you know, cell death. First of all, we want, don't want the cells to be dead, right? So we want them to be senescent. Then we measure things like SA beta gal. Um, we measure proliferation rates with EDU incorporation. And then we measure a whole panel of SASP and um, other genes. So we look at P16, P21, GDF15, 
let's see if I can remember them all, um, DPP4 <laughs> and, and a few other things. So we have a, a panel of things that we look at to help uh, ensure us these are actually senescent. Great question. Uh, Renee? Wonderful talk, Nathan. So many areas to like dig in, but I'll start with the one, <laughs> which is around technology. So with looking at like the Summer Scan platform and the DA platform and like other technologies that you may have used, can you just kind of share your thoughts on like how well some of the signals for the same proteins that show up across the platforms correlate with each other? Um, and then what some of the uh, QC metrics look like for things like the Soma Scan or other, uh, you know, technologies? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that's a very, very important question too going forward and something the entire field will have to kind of contend with. Uh, and a very important caveat of the stuff I showed you today is that these some of these are cross-platform correlations, right? Um, but I think that, you know, um, definitely these uh, somologic platforms, while they have you know, we don't need a, as high of a level of expertise to use them some, but you know, you can pay the company and get a whole bunch of proteins out and, and a bunch of candidates. We have to also keep in mind, we're trusting kind of an indirect measurement. So we're getting a fluorescence reading and we have to trust that that's truly representing very specific binding of an aptamer to a protein. So I think, you know, these are great tools, especially for non-experts, but um, uh, it's important also to do, you know, anything you, to generate candidates, but you know it's important to do follow-up studies to use something more specific like mass spectrometry. I think when you use these platforms, but still very powerful tools um, that give us coverage you don't get necessarily with mass spec. Although there are these technologies now coming out and, and approaches that help uh, are improving coverage even with mass spec when you look at very difficult um, matrix, matrices right, like blood, right? So. Yes, and I, I'm not sure. I think there was a second question in there, and I may have uh, missed it. <laughs> that that was good. Thank you, Nathan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, I have I have also a lot of questions, but I will ask just one, and the rest hopefully once we meet and we can discuss them more. Uh, but I have a mm -hmm. question about. Uh, you mentioned that the proteostasis and uh, uh, the protein turno turnover are very important and the slower protein turnover is connected with uh, slower aging, if I understood well. Is that correct? Yes. Correct, so, yeah. So uh, that would mean that the enzymatic machinery involved in these processes is somehow changed. So it could be interesting to look into the enzymes and their activity or... Uh, you know, changes in uh, in the the enzymatic uh, component of of uh, that, uh, and yeah, how, how it very... is, I don't know, genet genetically uh, maybe uh, warranted that it's different. Yeah, that's a very good uh, idea. So that's actually not surprising. So not something we've thought of looking at before. But I think that's a really cool idea yeah because with uh reduced turnover yeah uh, you it, would expect these enzymes that would be having reduced activity particularly are are you thinking in particular with like a the degradation machinery and stuff i mean yeah. those are the things yeah. we've thought about a little bit uh uh and those are actually really well known to be correlated with aging and longevity as well so for example you know actually um uh, increasing autophagy is that is uh, more related to longevity. So there's a little right. bit of uh, yeah. nuance here that we yeah. uh, to understanding it, but yeah, it's very interesting to, I think a great idea to measure. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's, there is a lot of things that are completely unclear there and, um, you know, understudied and the uh, huge potential. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and of course I had a lot of other questions regarding uh, connecting uh, what you are doing with what I am doing with cellular signaling changes in in the monocytes and but we can talk about it later so I don't see any more questions any more questions from the speakers or panels no okay thank you very much uh, Nate and thanks to all the speakers for this great webinar and to Maggie for doing a great job both speaking and organizing majority of it and uh, 
I think this webinar showed us that there is so much diversity in uh, the approaches and uh, so much research can be done even in proteomics alone in the topic of aging and disease that uh, we certainly have work set, set out in front of us for many years to come and super interesting. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.